Hello, everybody, and welcome to Global Minnesota's International Day of Education. Our virtual seminar is now being broadcast around the world. There's people from over two dozen countries, uh, something over 1,800, close to 1,900 people pre-registered from nearly every state in the union. We're pleased to be able to have this opportunity and to offer it to you free of charge because we believe that this day focuses on one of the single most important elements of our mission, advancing international understanding and engagement. The theme for the day established by the international sponsor and coordinator of International Day of Education, UNESCO, the UN's Educational, Scientific and Cultural Organization is recovering and revitalizing education for the COVID-19 generation. This theme reminds us that we're in the middle of this pandemic and we have much to do to make sure that our learners, our educators, our families are able to continue moving forward on their educational path for all ages, of course. But we also are focused on that revitalized. We know that education in all of its aspects of life can always be improved in many elements, particularly the disparities and particularly um, the issues that we have uh, are ones that we need to focus on carefully. My name is Mark Ritchie and I have the, uh, on the honor of serving as the president of Global Minnesota. We're a 70 year old organization that's part of the World Affairs Councils of America, and we're pleased that they are our program partner for today. And we want to make sure that we have this pro kind of programming available free of charge to everyone. And we do that because we have very generous support from a number of sponsors for today, our members, and of course, our corporate members as well. We want to make a special thanks to our gold sponsors and our silver sponsors, the Sundance Family Foundation, Hormel Company, Communicating for Agriculture Exchange Programs, Highway Credit Union, Atomic Data, and St. Cloud State University, which made a very special contribution to ensure that all of this program will be accessible for those of you anywhere on the planet, deaf or hard of hearing, on the YouTube channel, there's a link that will help you go to the special YouTube channel um, with uh, ASL interpretation and closed captioning. We also have the support of a number of, of our local and some of the national corporations whose contributions also make this day possible. Uh, Carlson Family Foundation, Delta, Cargill, Medtronic, United Health Group, are our key larger contributors helping us put on today's program. And then finally to the several thousand members who are the generous and annual contributors that make this program and all the other hundreds of things that we do during the course of a year possible to be made public, free and accessible throughout the planet. We've been pushed hard during this COVID period because there are many things that we've had to change. But something that hasn't changed is the generosity of the supporters who believe in our mission, who believe that Minnesota and our nation should be a welcoming place, should be engaged globally, should be part of a larger planetary conversation like we're having today. These United Nations designated special days are moments where we pause at Global Minnesota to take a deeper look, whether it's World Food Day, like last October, World Health Day coming up in April, World Humanitarian Day, other days, we are sure that by joining in a global conversation, we'll deepen our understanding and we'll be able to share some of the things that we today are thinking about and focusing on within the broader context of the pandemic and of the disparities that have been exposed because of the economic crisis created by the pandemic. Today, we will be very honored to have our opening presentation, the Director General of UNESCO. I don't know how many of you watching right at this moment had the opportunity 
to uh, catch the opening ceremonies held in Paris linked to New York the earlier this morning. For some of you, it would have been quite early, but it was a powerful, very excellent beginning of this day, kicking off global observances and celebrations everywhere. And I hope you can find time to uh, join at uh, some moment and to watch uh, those opening words. Uh, Director General Audrey Azoulay is the uh, leader of UNESCO. She was a former Minister of Culture of the government of France. And she's been the key person that has kept pushing forward the concept of protecting our cultural heritage in places of crisis and places of conflict. Uh, her voice has been loud and clear about the necessity of keeping ourselves moving ahead in the midst of this crisis of COVID and the need for people at the grassroots in every community, in our governments and at a global level to step up and make sure that the impacts of this climate and COVID twin pandemics, the impact on education, especially on girls and especially on all learners in communities who have less access to the kind of technology that some of us enjoy, we have to make sure that we concentrate on those issues and today will be a chance to really lift that out. Some of you know the history of UNESCO. It grew out of the League of Nations. Uh, there was an international committee for intellectual cooperation trying to heal some of the wounds and divisions of the First World War. And at that first meeting when the UN was being created out in San Francisco in 1945, a governor of the state of Minnesota was one of the five asked by President Roosevelt to be part of creating the United Nations. And our Governor Sasson came home from fighting in the war in the Pacific, and he was one of the strongest voices for human rights, for the broader understanding that peace only comes through justice. But he also was the advocate for keeping the society's voice present in international matters. And when the, uh, Governor Stassen died uh, relatively recently, uh, Kofi Annan, who was direct, uh, Secretary General of the UN, who had graduated from university here in Minnesota, he eulogized Governor Stassen saying that the international community had lost one of its greatest leaders, one of the people who kept the voice of society engaged in the great work of helping to create the peaceful global community. We're fortunate to have a governor with the same passion about making Minnesota a global place, a governor who has been himself a teacher, a public school teacher in social studies. I love that because I trained to be a social studies teacher. And Governor Waltz also was for over two decades uh, a member of, a listed leader of the Minnesota National Guard. And in this occasion, we are so pleased that he could take time to uh, record for us a welcome message and to introduce our keynote speaker. They're in the middle of legislative session. And so we're just glad that there was time to do this. Um, I'm very, very pleased to call and to ask for the message from our governor, Tim Wall. Hi everyone, I'm Tim Walls, governor of the great state of Minnesota. A big welcome to the folks viewing this event from around the world. As a classroom teacher for more than 20 years and a parent of a child in public schools, I've seen firsthand the power of education to change lives. I believe that each and every child must receive an education that prepares them for success in the future workforce and in our democracy. That's why today's event theme, Recover and Revitalize Education for the COVID-19 Generation is so incredibly important. Too often, race or zip code and income can determine the quality of a children's education. The COVID-19 pandemic has shed a bright light on these disparities as our educators, school staff, families, and students rose to the challenge of distance learning. Distance learning has been hard on our students, but for our students of color and indigenous students, low-income students, students experience homelessness, students with limited internet access, those in greater Minnesota, English language learners, students with disabilities, and many more, distance learning has been even harder. The disparities in our educational system hold back not only our students, but our entire state and country from reaching our full potential. And as schools get back in person, it's crucial that we work towards education recovery and revitalization together. 
We must tackle the challenge of the past and present, intentionally designing our education system to ensure that each individual student thrives. This means that each and every student's educational experience values who they are and supports them to reach their highest potential both in and out of school. I want to take a moment to acknowledge everyone who made this event happen. Thank you to the team at Global Minnesota, all of the speakers and sponsors, and the leadership at UNESCO for coming together to make this special day possible. I'm excited to introduce today's keynote speaker, the head of the entire Global International Day of Education, Director General of UNESCO, Audrey Azule. Director General Azule is the former Minister of Culture and Communication for France and a tireless advocate for advancing education for all worldwide. It is now my honor to welcome Director General Azule. I'm very honored to be taking part in uh, this symposium organized by Global Minnesota for the International Day of Education. And I'd like to start by thanking its president, Mark Ritchie. Like Global Minnesota, UNESCO was founded on an ideal to promote education as one of the common goods of humanity. Because education is not only a basic right enshrined in Article 26 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. It is also an essential lever to respond to the challenges facing our world. And yet, in recent months, this right has been called into question like never before, maybe. A series of crises has emerged, which we must rise above together. A health, educational, economic crisis, a social crisis marked by rising inequalities and discrimination, an environmental crisis, a crisis of confidence in science and in the facts. After a year as difficult as 2020, being pessimistic would be easy. But 2021 gives us many reasons to hope. Because as the past year has shown us so painfully, education is a human right, a public good, and a public responsibility, as the theme of this symposium reminds us. As you know, at the peak of the pandemic, our figures have shown that 91% of the global student population, 1.5 billion learners, were unable to attend school. Together, we saw the gap that is left in our lives and in the lives of our children. Not only in the field of learning, of course, but uh, as, as well in terms of cultural, social vocations, in terms of physical and mental health of our children. It is at school that we learn to live in society. It is at school that children receive attention and meals. Schools are also a place where girls and women receive sanctuary from violence. It is estimated uh, that in 2020, there could be an additional million forced pregnancies around the world. At a time when 11 million girls may never return to class, in addition to the 130 million who were already out of school before the pandemic, the danger is clear. Yes, 2020 was a year of disruption, but it was also a year of mobilization. As early as March, over 160 partners, international organizations like the World Health Organization, the World Bank, major companies and education actors joined forces as part of the Global Education Coalition launched by UNESCO. I would like to thank uh, all the US companies that joined this movement, IBM, Google, Microsoft, Uber, Verizon, and Facebook. Thanks to all our partners, the coalition and UNESCO supported the continuity of learning and the reopening of schools in over 70 countries, benefiting millions of pupils and teachers. Firstly, we took action on the educational front to ensure that learning could continue. But we also took action on the health front by organizing the sharing of best practices. This joint action showed us that when education actors all stand together, they are very powerful force. This is true in emergency situations, but it's also true for long-term challenges. Against racism, against anti-Semitism, against discrimination and social injustice, education is our best ally. Respect for others, acceptance of difference, fight against racism, this can be taught, and I know how committed Global Minnesota is in this field. 
in addition to a campaign united against racism, which has been viewed hundreds of thousands of times, UNESCO has launched a series of masterclasses to fight racism and discrimination, training thousands of students and teachers around the world. Education is also a very powerful lever to combat global warming and the collapse of biodiversity. This is why we encourage dialogue between our member states and support the sharing of good teaching practices in this field. In May, we will present the best global initiatives uh, in terms of uh, education for environment at the UNESCO World Conference on Education for Sustainable Development in Berlin. Education is also essential in developing critical thinking, in debunking fake news and conspiracy theories, in using social media without being controlled by it. This is why UNESCO has integrated recent technological innovations, including algorithm, into media and information literacy programs. In April, we will officially launch this program for countries to support them in teaching these skills, which are more and more necessary. As all of these issues show, education should not be considered a cost, but an investment and one of the most important investments there are. Yet, the funding that has been committed to education is insufficient and threatened by the current situation. According to our calculations, education budgets in low and medium income countries could drop up to $200 billion per year because of COVID-19, 40% of the sum needed annually to achieve the United Nations goal for 2030 in education. We need more investment and we need it now. Recovery plans are a window of opportunity in this respect and one we should not miss. This was the message sent by over 70 heads of state and governments and ministers at the global education meeting organized by UNESCO last October. They recommitted to allocating between 15 and 20% of public spending to education and increasing international aid for education. We also need to invest better because the pandemic has underlined the importance of ensuring that education reflects the time so it can respond to the challenges of our time, climate change, technological revolution or prejudice. This is why we've also launched as part of our initiative on the futures of education, a global conversation on tomorrow's education. Nearly 1 million educators, learners, Parents, citizens have already contributed to these reflections, which will be presented in a report published later this year with the support of the President of the Federal Democratic Republic of Ethiopia, Sally Wokzude, who chairs this International Commission for the Futures of Education. The Commission will focus on the lessons to be learned from this period and especially on the importance of distance learning because the last few months have shown the advantages, but also uh, the limitations of an all digital or all distance learning approach. As we've seen, learners need to interact with their teachers. Effective education requires face-to-face -face contact. This is why teachers and educators are so central to school systems. We must give them more, not less, resources, more training and more consideration. And indeed, the countries that have best responded to the learning disruptions of 2020 are those where teachers are better qualified, better trained and better considered. Because school systems depend first and foremost on teachers, UNESCO works with countries and partners to make them central to our social projects. They are the best possible investment for the health, for the development of our societies. All of these discussions all of these issues impacting the future of education guide our work and our reflections every day in the field along with UNESCO's member states. We invite each and every one of you to take a seat at this table, the table of multilateralism, because we need all of you on board. Only in this way, UNESCO and the United States will be able to achieve the ideal of uh, Archibald Mike Leach the American poet and librarian of Congress, who said, and I quote, of course, we can educate for world peace. 
I'd be willing to go a great deal farther than that. I'd be willing, for my own part, to say that there is no possible way of getting world peace except through education. And with his words, I conclude. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Director General Azoulay, for those words that remind us that the crisis has been deep, that remind us that there are people working everywhere courageously, cre creatively, and also with compassion to not only bring us through this pandemic, but to keep those words about build back better alive and make it go forward. In this way, your call for having us all recommit to multilateralism is a very important part of our whole uh, approach at Global Minnesota. It is central to how we've organized the day. The morning will look from the global to the national to the local. In the afternoon, we'll be focused on people at the front line and the creative and courageous ways that people have been tackling and special things that people have been doing to bring this forward. For those of you who are members um, among this nearly 2000 that have registered, pre-registered for today, thank you. You know that you make these kinds of programs possible. For those of you who are learning with us today and are appreciating what you're seeing, uh, there's instructions there on the YouTube channel if you would like to join or contribute. Um, we urge you to be part of this process and we're just thrilled to have uh, so many people from so many countries and from every part of our nation with us today. Today's program will move through a big picture and then down to some very specific things. And at the end of the day, we'll talk some about some of the efforts underway to make sure that we continue to stay connected and the ways to help encourage um, our government, particularly at the national level, to engage even more with UNESCO and to re-engage and to directly become part of the broader conversations. A person who will help us think about that in the next phase is the Global General Secretary of Education International, which is truly one of the uh, most important and central of global organizations that have brought together around the planet educators, uh, 32 million in fact, in the organizations in um, over 170 countries from around the, around the world. Uh, David came to that position about a decade ago or to that organization. He's uh, only recently become in this position, but in the, his career, he among other things was a public school, high school teacher, also was one of the education specialists at the Organization of American States and served as an associate director for uh, the National Education Association here in the United States. That focus, that moving from the local in the school to the hemisphere in the nation, and now stepping forward to be the leader for the global association of the educators is an example of the kind of leadership that individuals can and many do bring to this notion of using education and how we learn from each other as part of the process of building peace, of building this planet into a more peaceful, a safer, sustainable, more resilient place. I mentioned earlier, Governor Stassen, who was tapped by Roosevelt to be one of the founders of the United Nations. Over the years, he was very, very close to and fond of UNESCO because he went on to be a the president of uh, the University of Pennsylvania. And UNESCO would tap him on occasion to do special projects and he would take a leave from his work to help, for example, to create a new university in Turkey and other really when politically sensitive and politically important large scale things. Um, Minnesotans have always been there to be part of that global process, whether it's UNESCO or the World Food Program or the World Health Organization. And so we're very, very proud and pleased to be able to be part of this larger conversation that's taking place here today. We will be moving into a uh, big picture. Uh, David Edwards has been tracking exactly what has been happening to 
students, to learners everywhere, to educators, to teachers everywhere. And some of that was reflected in the uh, kickoff ceremony uh, that uh, Director General Azule led this from the UNESCO headquarters there in Paris this morning. Um, again, I wanna urge any of you who uh, would like to see a really uh, kind of co complete picture from what UNESCO's activities are, uh, that would be worth going to their website at some point. Uh, they will archive it uh, in this coming week, I believe. So it's a kind of thing where we can work together. Uh, we're in Minnesota, but we're all virtual and global. UNESCO is in Paris, but they're virtual and global. And all of you joining today have come to see how we can use these tools to put ourselves into new kinds of relationships to actually help each other to get through this particular crisis. And this is something especially teachers have been helping each other and helping families and families have been helping each other. Uh, but also we can be clear about the necessity to build back better. And that makes me very, very pleased that Dr. David Edwards could join us today uh, from his offices in Brussels. Uh, Dr. Edwards, are you there? Can you join me on the screen? Hi, Mark. Welcome. Thank you very much. It's so nice to be with you. I want to thank you um, in your capacity as president, Mark, and also Global Minnesota, and thank Governor Waltz for his words. And I also just wanted to say hi to my friend, Mary Catherine Richter, who I know is now your education commissioner, but uh, I knew her previously as an AFT leader and member of Education International. It's just a real pleasure to join you all today. And um, I thought that was some very helpful but sobering information from my friend, Director General Asule. And I wanna thanks to her and her many other colleagues around the world. The perspectives and priorities of educators and students are not just simply an additional viewpoint. The input of teachers is instead becoming embedded into global discussions on the way forward. And advocates in the education sector are working together now in common purpose to an unprecedented degree. And I'd like to say that UNESCO under Audrey's leadership deserves much of the credit. In that spirit, I wanted to speak with you all today about the teaching profession globally, as Mark said, in the context of this past year, what we have experienced, what we've learned and a little bit about where we are going and most importantly, where we need to be going. I'd like to start by telling you a little bit about EI. Mark mentioned it already, but Education International is the global federation of education unions representing more than 32 million teachers and education support personnel from early childhood education to university and 385 affiliated member organizations in 178 countries. Our headquarters, is in Brussels, where I am speaking to you from right now. And we have regional offices in Africa, Asia, Europe, Latin America, North America, and the Caribbean. Our mission is to promote the universal right to quality public education, advocate for the professional status, rights, and working conditions of educators, to be a leader in the fight for social justice and equity. And then came COVID. In the span of months, 1.5 billion students out of school. That's billion with a B. And I think it's really hard to wrap our heads around such a number. It's as if a global hurricane swept through and each of us was cast into boats to do the best we could. Of course, existing inequalities were laid bare and exacerbated by the crisis. So the, the people of the world, same storm, but very different boats. Imagine no access to the internet. That's nearly half the world's population. Picture no electricity. That's close to a billion people. For every student a teacher could actually engage, many more were left out because of lack of resources. Missing learning time they can never make up. And in many parts of the world, falling back into child labor or the low priority status too often afforded to girls. Wherever they could, educators stayed on the job, reinventing their professional practice by the hour, teaching lessons over internet video apps in Belgium, recording radio broadcasts in the Republic of Congo, driving school buses with mobile Wi-Fi to provide hotspots in remote locations of the US. Social media platforms lit up with teachers sharing tips, ideas, technologies, and learning management strategies from their kitchens 
from their cars or socially distanced classroom, scaling emergency learning with no planning or lead time. Everyone who could sorted through the chatter to find what worked best right now. What do we know? What matters? What can wait? What lesson do I eliminate? Who didn't get breakfast? How do we protect our kids? How do we find the kid who seemed to simply disappear? As the story of this crisis unfolded, it revealed some universal basic truths in education. First, teachers and students need to be safely together in schools. Ask any parent, ask any teacher. Among the first actions we took in the pandemic was to survey our members to establish guidelines for safely reopening schools. The guidelines led with a call for transparent communications from governments with decisions closely tied to the advice of health experts, continuous dialogue with educators and their unions, and the recognition with resources that already vulnerable students and education workers may continue to be the most affected. Teachers and education support personnel all over the world, they mobilized for their students and their unions, and they emerged as primary structures of support, providing practical information, advice, and spaces to share experiences and work together. In many countries, unions have also been instrumental in guiding government response to the crisis. We at EI, we've worked directly in an official advisory capacity with the World Health Organization to keep educators informed and to keep the safe reopening of schools high on the global agenda. UNESCO and EI have been urging globally that educators and education support personnel be included as a priority group for vaccinations. And I am so pleased to see that this is already the policy in Minnesota, but still not in nearly enough places. Time and again, we heard the same thing, that schools are irreplaceable. They are the heart of our communities, centers of learning and health, central to our economies and our sense of nationhood and identity. Parents and communities reinforce the notion of schools as a foundation for emotional development, socialization, and nutritional well being of children. At the same time, the crisis gave us fresh perspective on research often cited by the OECD's Andreas Schleicher, specifically research that showed that the skills that are easiest to teach and test are also the skills that are easiest to digitize, automate, and outsource. The dead-end future families fear and nations scramble to avoid. Specifically, the idea that teachers could be replaced by some form of transactional technology was exposed. But nowhere has the pandemic taught us to re-examine the role of teachers and schools more than in this area of technology and the tools of teaching and learning. Do you remember when the pandemic hit and all those carefully prepared and highly collaborative distance learning systems swung into action? Remember that? No, I don't either because it didn't happen. Well, for the most part, online and distance teaching and learning was never a plan or a collaboration between school systems and educators and families. Instead, in many parts of the world, it was and is mostly a Wall Street wager for entrepreneurs and hedge funds in an evidence-free marketplace of promises. Teachers in far too many places are guinea pigs as education technology experiments cycled through schools. Governments and school leaders routinely failed even basic due diligence on the front end or had accountability on the back for using public money to buy what we now know to be snake oil. We used to be told that ed tech would introduce a much needed disruption of the education system. Instead, the pandemic was the disruption and it led to a bonanza for ed tech, its biggest year ever in 2020. Startups in the US alone raised a reported 2.2 billion in venture and private equity capital. That's a 30% increase 
from the 2019 total. So get ready. The salespeople are coming. Fact is, we do need better technology, better experiences. EI has had protocols in place to help guide the use of technology in education for many years. Digital technology should be an essential part of an educator's professional practice, integrated into the schools as a tool to enhance teaching and learning, accompanied by professional development and the collaborative work needed to make that tool effective. Looking ahead, the lack of effective tools and resources and the absence of training and collaborative time to use what's already in hand is a symptom of an overall crisis that now seems certain to outlive the pandemic. The world's education systems are in deep trouble. Today, International Education Day, our colleagues at the Global Campaign for Education have launched the One Billion Voices campaign to raise a worldwide alarm about what they call the seismic threat to education progress already underway. The World Bank has already projected a potential 10% cut in education budgets due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Our colleagues at GCE said, the world faces a tipping point as vulnerable communities, including children with disabilities, are excluded from education. Overall, they say, it is increasingly urgent for governments to involve civil society organizations in the drawing up of education budgets. That's us. And it seems very straightforward, doesn't it? I mean, public demands for allocating resources and holding politicians accountable make a difference. Families and communities can join with teachers and others to insist that decisions about national priorities and resources be made in a democratic fashion. In some places, it's called social dialogue. In other settings, it's called negotiation. Where I come from in Western Pennsylvania, it might be called being at the table instead of on the menu. But straightforward does not always mean easy or simple, especially when powerful political forces work to delegitimize government and the public sector, and especially the very idea of truth. We know that among the countries most deeply, deeply affected by the pandemic, denial has trumped dialogue. Many of these hard hit nations, including the US, have been led by anti-science authoritarians who've encouraged their followers to embrace nonsensical medical treatments, failed to properly resource the public sector in health or education, and then pitted their political movements against both medical facts and the media that report them. By contrast, countries that have experienced less severe outbreaks of the pandemic and are transitioning more smoothly back to school and work, focus sharply on science, have robust public sectors and media and unions. The tools to make government work in a democracy are straightforward, and they're built around the lessons most of us learned in school. Public policies must be grounded in fact. Fictions are fictions. They're not just the other side of truths. The public sector, like the Republic itself, to paraphrase Franklin, belongs to us all, if we can keep it. Health, education, public safety are public goods constantly under threat that can never be taken for granted. Last week, President Biden recalled the painful lesson taught to us by lies told for power and for profit. He said, each of us has a duty and responsibility as citizens, as Americans, and especially as leaders. Leaders who have pledged to honor our constitution and protect our nation, to defend the truth and to defeat the lies. After the last four years, these words have an especially profound meaning in our country. But they resonate around the world especially at a time when the U.S. begins to re-enter the global community. This re-entry comes at a time of profound and deepening crisis for children and education worldwide. The U.N. Secretary General Antonio Guterres called it a defining moment for the world's children and young people. Less than a decade ago, the U.N. unanimously declared 
that free, high-quality, equitable education is a critical global goal for sustainable development, essential to democracy, and a linchpin to solving the climate crisis and hunger, just for starters. Educated societies with vital public sectors are healthier. Family incomes are higher. National poverty is reduced. So is child labor and violence against girls and women. EI was so proud to help lead the fight for these goals, mobilizing educators in a two-year campaign in every continent, in every corner of the globe. And all of us know that quality education is not inevitable. Like democracy, too often we realize its true value only in its absence. When we are forced to pay the price for a crisis born of ignorance and neglect, of dismal and, let's face it, deceitful leadership. As educators and unionists, we have the responsibility to teach and defend the truth. Going forward, we have an added duty, an absolute responsibility to identify, call out, and correct misinformation, disinformation, and outright lies. I will say, fully acknowledging my partisanship and revealing the content of my absentee ballot, that the U.S. election has already had a profoundly positive effect on the course of the pandemic in the U.S., and the effect will only grow and have a global impact. Let this same transition be the start of an equally profound effect on the lives of all of our children everywhere, because the whole world is watching. Thank you very much. David, thank you so much for those inspiring words, but also for that big picture about how impactful this COVID has been, about all those different ways that educators and teachers and families and people have responded and about the challenges in front of us, especially when some would cut further or some would not directly ad address some of these issues. And so I wanted to ask you just a little bit more here, very specifically this campaign, The Billion Voices. Can you tell all of the folks watching from around the planet how we could get involved? What's the, um, what's the way to find out just a little more about that? Sure, so, so Global Campaign for Education is um, it actually goes back to, without getting into the sort of education history, it, go, it goes back to Dakar. Before where there were sustainable development goals, um, we had education for all. And at that time, the world leaders were not listening to civil society. And so all of the social movements, the NGOs, the teachers unions, it was actually partly led by Nobel laureate Kailash Satyarthi. Um, we got together and we formed the global campaign for education. And there is a global campaign for education, I believe in almost every single country in the world. The one in the US, I think for many of the folks in, in Minnesota would be most familiar with, um, but that's global campaign for education US, and you can actually sign up to get part of the Billion Voices campaign. And I would encourage you to do that because in the US, part of the campaign is ensuring that the US pays its fair share in coming back into the world uh, community as well as making sure that education and educational opportunities in the United States um, are available to everyone. So thanks for asking. Yeah, and David, you know, we're, uh, we're in Minnesota devoted to the sustainable development goals uh, all along. See the pin. And um, so for example, on World Food Day, of course, we were looking at the goal of zero hunger and um, on World Health Day, you know, uh, good health and well-being for all. In fact, we wanna bring a World Expo to Minnesota on sustainable development goal number three on good health. But when you um, saw that need to get civil society more involved, it seemed like you were able to find a very wide range of partners, a very wide range of civil society voices and companies and, and, and others. Is this um, now uh, a way that we could see that term build back better? Could build back better be in fact build back and reach those 17 sustainable development goals by 2030? Well, I, th I think it's a great question, Mark. I, I, I think I'm a big believer in social accountability. Um, 
And, and I think the way in which you get social accountability to be embedded into making sure that, the, that we deliver on the SDGs is first and foremost to make sure from a rights-based approach that all families, all parents, all students, all communities understand what those goals are, what the indicators of their success are, and the ways in which to get involved in sure of making sure that governments you know, live up to the commitments that they've made to, to realize, like every year at the high level political forum, governments come and they give updates on their, you know, on their progress. And I think that, you know, the constituency of civil society is one of the most powerful um, that we can have. I do think we have to be careful because um, it's not a gift that governments give or that, that anyone sort of gives to us. It's a responsibility we have, and we have to be able to claim it forcefully, and we have to be able to, once we get the space, also show up. One of the things that I, I often think is that um, no is not a policy proposal. It's good to be able to say no, but it's really important for civil society to come together and, and generate really good proposals for financing, for funding, for follow through, for monitoring, evaluation, and, and so on. So I think there's a huge role. I think it's an important part of, of the SDGs. And I think it's something that we have to continue to work at because civil society sometimes runs the risk of being an afterthought. We, let's, let's invite someone from civil society to this panel to that thing. And we need to really say, no, no, the main social accountability mechanism is civil society. Well, I really appreciate that perspective because I know, you know, some of the things we work on here, for example, the Sustainable Development Goal 3 about health, uh, 3.6 is reduce road fatalities and injuries by half by 2030. Well, it takes everybody to address distracted driving, drunk driving, uh, road safety engineering, public education enforcement. And I know for us, uh, like some of our largest players, like for example, the company Cargill, who internally made the decision to ban the use of cell phones by anybody during the day or at night on their phone and took the lead on lobbying the state legislature to get cell phone distracted driving banning. So your message about how we all are responsible resonates, I think, with that general notion that we're now uh, deeply moving towards uh, governance by goals, so to speak. We have climate goals that we must reach. We have goals on uh, deadly driving. We have goals on zero hunger. I know that uh, your organization and teachers in general have been looking down the road. What are the issues that have become, you know, ones that we've heard about? Uh, Director General this morning spoke about the technology questions and others. I believe that there's some initiative underway to try to strengthen and update the Convention on the Rights of the Child. Uh, we're in a new era. The first convention was coming out of the First World War. Uh, children were abandoned, children were wounded, children were dismembered, children you know, were in fact a critical part of what we understood about why we could no longer go on with these wars and these world wars. Can you give us any insights into where that kind of movement from what's an afterthought to what's crucial to what's a right might go into the future? Yeah, no, I think that's a, it's a really great question. And I think um, a lot of us and a lot of agencies are rethinking the assumptions that informed the decision-making at the time in which some things were, were, were drafted. Um, the CRC, the ratification of it um, committee, in our own uh, country. Convention on the Rights, on of, the the rights of the Child. Excuse yeah. me, the Convention on the Rights of the Child. I get caught in acronym soup. I don't know if you do as well, but uh, <laughs> Absolutely. It's, one of my, it's one of my big problems. I try. But, um, you know, it's it's partly because of the ratification process in the United States. When I was at NEA, I was, we worked on the CRC campaign. Um, but if you look at the sort of the movements now, if you look at it sort of Malala, if you, know, if you look um, at the, the climate movement, um, if you look at what students themselves are doing, they're no longer the subjects, or excuse me, they're no longer the sort of the objects of what you, they're the subjects of their own destiny. They're rights holders who are not gonna wait for others to sort of solve their problems. They have views. 
And um, one of the things I'm really excited about, whether that's in terms of climate literacy or climate action, is I'm seeing student activism paired up with teacher activism and, and citizen action, demands for civic space, demands for civic education, for science to be taught, um, where you also have it going worldwide, where you have, you have the, the Global Students Forum, which is now forming. You have all sorts of student organizations that are, you have the Youth Forum at the COP, at the, at the Climate uh, Summit. You have it at the UN. Um, and there is actual accountability mechanisms being developed by, by young people, um, by the rights holders, who are going to inherit this planet, who are already not even waiting for inherit it. They, they're here now. It's not something that's going to come to them later. They're already claiming this is their planet, this is their future, and they're not going to stand by idly while someone tries to talk to them about clean coal curriculum or something like that. They want to actually know what the science is on renewables and, and things like that. So I find that to be really exciting. I think one of the challenges what we're going to have is, is that um, how some of these organizations are funded and supported so that they can, they, they're sustainable and can continue. They have a governance structure so that they can't be gamed and picked. Um, and that uh, it's, it's part of the, the larger sort of social accountability mechanisms that I talked about earlier. Um, um, I know in the United States, um, we've been really, really impacted by how young people have been the leadership on gun violence because when terrorists wanted to terrorize society, they went and shot our children and the children have said, stop. No, we must change. It's also been the case in the racial justice movement and the climate movement. So in this last election, the youth vote was the record breaking and not just the vote, but the, you know, every aspect of old fashioned organizing was driven and dynamically so by young leaders. So it seems like one part of this future of building back better includes that uh, input and that leadership and direction from the young people who are in fact leading on the social movements. I know one of the uh, big issues that will um, roll forward is the re-engagement by the United States at the global level. Uh, um, Minnesota wants to host a World Expo and uh, we were not able to uh, put forth a bid because a couple decades ago, Congress decided that, well, we don't need to do that. And they had just dropped out and stopped paying dues of the international body. It took a lot of work to get consensus in the legislature with two presidents, but we were able to get them moving. And once they re-engaged and got the back dues paid of the Bureau of International Exposition, then suddenly the embrace of our ideas, our bid, our concept, and just of us as Americans rejoining um, the international you know, body, especially because we were so crucial at the creation, um, you know, just gave a lot of energy. And I'm, I'm, I'm anxious to see how that will re-energize us when we do move towards the, the total re-engagement in UNESCO. And I know that the National uh, Education Association in the United States, among others, is really taking a, one of the leadership roles. And I believe that in one of our green rooms here, um, Lily Garcia, the media past president of the National Education Association, who's written a powerful, powerful call on the US to rejoin. I wonder if uh, Lily can, oh, there you are, Lily. Greetings and, and welcome from El Paso. We won't talk weather yet. We'll get to that later. But Lily, your leadership in both the Education International, but here um, in the United States, in the NEA is really important. But now you're stepping out and helping to guide and direct that public voice about the importance and necessity, the crucial uh, work needed to rejoin UNESCO and to do it soon. Can you give us some background and, and, and uh, recruit all of the folks watching here onto this campaign? Uh, thank you, Mark. And thank you for inviting me to just uh, share a little bit about what I think is a very, very important piece of work uh, that the United States has to do. Uh, and 
Uh, and you can see why we're so proud of uh, David Edwards now, uh, who started out with NEA when I think, what were you, 14 years old, David? <laughs> uh, and you still look 14. Uh, but I also want to give a big shout out to my Education Minnesota uh, family here and Denise Beck, uh, their president. Uh, happy, happy, happy International Day of Education. Uh, to everyone who's celebrating in this virtual uh, event. And thanks to everyone, not just the organizations, but all of the individuals who are on this uh, event call right now, because you're invested in the future of students across the world. And I am so excited. You can see why David is so excited. We're all excited um, to include now in people who love public education and love our students, our new Biden administration. Um, we're not always gonna agree with everything that they do, but we've got an open door and they do appreciate, appreciate um, what we have to say as educators and as advocates. So I'm, I'm, uh, I, I have hope today, like I haven't had in oh so many years. And I wanna congratulate President Biden. Can I just say those beautiful words one more time? President Biden. So thank you, President Biden, for taking very swift action to bring the United States back into the world community after four years of unnecessary isolation, because our voice and our influence have been absent in so many places, in so many ways, and my heart sings that some of the first actions of this new administration were to lift up the importance of American participation in things like the Paris Agreement on Climate Change, the World Health Organization, the Human Rights Council. And now it's time, especially on this International Day of Education, to add returning to UNESCO to this list. So let me just give folks just the, the briefest background. The UN and UNESCO, of course, is an acronym. So David's right, we need to stop talking in alphabet soup. The UN Educational Scientific and Cultural Organization was founded in 1945, right after uh, the horrendous World War II uh, aftermath. It was the American poet, Archibald MacLeish, who wrote the first line of the UNESCO Constitution. And it's a line that defines its mission. It guides how its programs will be developed. He said, since wars begin in the minds of men, it's in the minds of men that the defenses of peace must be constructed. And so for 75 years, UNESCO has labored in this construction of peace using the tools of education, science, and culture to build those bridges that join us in our common humanity and our connected futures. And our hands uh, in the United States have been absent too long from this labor. I had the opportunity, in fact, David uh, uh, went with me. Um, I was representing Education International and the National Education Association, AFT, our, our affiliates in Canada and the uh, Caribbean. I, I'm, I'm a vice president of our North American um, Caribbean region, which also includes Mexico. And I was there at UNESCO in Paris, uh, I think it was 2011, which seems like a lifetime ago. And I was there representing um, the World uh, Federation of Teachers Organizations. As, as David said, 32 million educators, 174 countries. And we were there to participate in World Teacher Day, which was a commemoration and participation in a policy roundtable on the state of the teaching profession. And we were preparing the framework of action around the soon to be adopted sustainable development goals and UNESCO was the lead agency on education. But while all that work was going on, I was just amazed at what else was going on in that building. Across the hall, throughout the building, were parallel discussions regarding world heritage sites, anti-Semitism, discrimination in all its forms, press freedom, 
scientific advancement. And I loved that UNESCO understood the importance of all of these connections. I am a certified elementary teacher. My life's work has been um, as an educator to realize the education of what we call the whole child, creative, critical mind, healthy body, ethical, compassionate character. And I felt that harmony of connections and purpose in UNESCO. There was no one size fits all, just memorize this. It was holistic. It was an epicenter of global collaboration around not just the most important ideas that shape the future of the planet, but the most fundamental values that have to serve as the building blocks. Education, science, culture in service to what? To a more peaceful, just, sustainable world. And I don't look at UNESCO's work as an act of charity that the United States needs to get back into UNESCO because uh, we're somehow the donor nation. UNESCO's work is an act of justice. And it's not just about fixing developing countries. UNESCO impacts me as an American teacher working in one of the richest countries on the planet. I need UNESCO. I need a place that brings the world's finest minds together for collaborative discussions, publications, training on multi I can't even say that, multi-dimensional approaches to child development, reflective pedagogy on the nature of learning itself to know, to be, to do, to live together. What's more relevant today and more foundational to American challenges than the rise we've just seen in anti-democratic forces, authoritarianism, white nationalism, a lot of diverse organizations and individuals who are using the common tools of disinformation, distrust of the other, divisions based on race, ethnicity, culture, by denying science, whether it's COVID or climate change. Their purpose is the opposite of peaceful justice. And it lives here in our home, here in the United States. We need UNESCO in this essential long-term work of peace. But today, right here, right now, there is urgent, immediate work to do. It can't wait for the long term. The immediate crisis of rebuilding education systems ravaged by this pandemic. It's going to require all hands on deck right here, right now. And America has been watching from the back of the room. UNESCO's Institute for Educational Statistics is the premier global body aggregating educational data. Its global education monitoring report team is at the forefront of analysis and insight. Its International Institute for Education Planning systemically brings together the best research, the best training on education planning. In fact, UNESCO's Global Education Coalition is the world's main body where all education actors from the public and the private sector can come together to coordinate the response in addressing the needs of those over 1 billion students that, that David was talking about, who lost access to schooling and educational services. And you know that those students live in the world's poorest nations and in the world's richest nations. The United States has the world's richest school systems and the world's poorest, depending on which zip code you live in. We need this help. The United States can't afford to be a simple observer. We have to have a seat at the table, contributing, learning, designing, improving. And it has to be practical and evidence-based and it has to maintain the highest standards of equity of access and opportunity. I was really taken by your comments because they were so reflected in all the world uh, examples brought together this morning at UNESCO's kickoff ceremony. 
because they tapped into people's experience, but it was a reminder how important UNESCO is. And you've just summed it up beautifully for us. I think about this um, from a lot of different angles. Global Minnesota works a lot in the schools, but we were born uh, by a group of, of women community leaders 70 years ago, 1951, who could see that international students were coming to Minnesota and to the whole country, and some were having a rough time. Some were being met with racial attack and other really serious things. And they said, we cannot tolerate this. They created first a kind of informal group to greet and then welcome and then support international students and faculty, some, but mostly students. And, and we've grown uh, since that time. But this morning and the UNESCO program, there was a leader from the international organization that does a lot of uh, the international exchange of students. Uh, he was saying that they're 100 years old and they've lived through nine pandemics. But this was the only one that touched everybody on the planet. And I was taken by his uh, overview, that historic understanding, but also about how he has distinguished this particular pandemic from the others that have been devastating in different places and different times in different ways. And I believe that that's part of the wisdom in a way of those who created a UNESCO, a World Health Organization, a food and agriculture organization, et cetera, is that they knew that over time we needed to gather and sustain attention, expertise. You were describing the international statistical bodies and others. And we also need to make sure that by knowing our history, we know what is similar and what is different. We know where we've made progress and where we're falling backwards. And it feels like this moment now, uh, and you both have referenced the uh, kind of new energy coming from Washington. I was uh, struck by that in this uh, YouTube um, uh, channel where Dr. Jill Biden, just a couple of days after the swearing in, uh, did a seminar and some speaking for that the teachers put together in the United States. And I think anyone watching this now could find that, but she was so clear about both the passion, but also the commitment, the long-term. But she also was, you know, she explained, she was having to teach her classes as she was getting on the plane to go to the inauguration. I mean, this is a teacher now at the highest levels who gets it, but also has the ability to articulate it in ways that learners, educators and others. So I feel like um, my, broken heart of the grief and the dislocation and you know we could describe this in all kinds of ways is one part of me but another part of me is the opening up that is happening in the conversation and the real possibilities of re-engagement but also as you were describing how you as a teacher as a leader need UNESCO but also we need each other this idea of the pandemic you know, we're Minnesotans, so we're always quoting, you know, Paul Wellstone, our senator who was killed tragically, and his most famous quote, just flat, flat out, we all do better when we all do better. Now people are creating new ways, like we can't all do better until we all do better when it comes to this pandemic. And this is going to be part of our heritage and who we are going forward is, the question isn't, you know, how did you handle? The question is, how did you build back better? And it feels like the leadership from the uh, teachers' organizations and from teachers themselves, the leadership from your international organization and from these wonderful groups that are coming together in these campaigns is going to be crucial. Is there? Um, a way for us to be able to make available to the couple thousand or so people that have pre-registered or signed up in some way um, the statement that will be coming uh, because you were clear and people are looking for 
uh, ways. And we'll even be talking about this again later today, but um, can I uh, count on you to get me a copy of this and I can make sure that, that it gets out? Yes, Mark, um, I'll, I'll send you the, the letter that I've sent to uh, President Biden uh, and his team. The, and, and other people, I, I encourage you to write to the Biden administration. And uh, just put it, White House, Washington, D.C. Uh, they, they know where it is. <laughs> they know where it is. Uh, but one of the reasons I was so excited to receive your invitation to be on this uh, is because UNESCO means so much to me. And because we are now not talking to a brick wall. We are talking, as you said, to someone who understands by being married to a teacher uh, exactly what it is. I always thought we should have our spouses be on our bargaining teams because it's our <laughs> spouses that know how much work we put into, uh, into uh, the joyful labor of being an educator. And I don't want us to get back into UNESCO um, with arrogance, with yes, we need to come in and save the world. We need a respectful partnership and UNESCO is all about building those bridges um, that have been burned, that have been ripped to shreds. I want people to know I, as an educator, as a sixth grade teacher from Utah, need UNESCO. And here you are, Education Minnesota, I mean, Global Minnesota. Uh, I come from Utah. People think of us as kind of like, well, yeah, you're like the middle class, whitest people in the whole wide world. There is such rich, beautiful diversity in our communities that most people who just know the brand of Minnesota or the brand of Utah, uh, they, they don't, they've never been on the ground to see that we are also relocation spots for refugees. Amen. They pick yes. our communities. And so our teachers need help in how do you not just navigate diversity, how do you make it bloom? How do you make it come to life and be something that you that you're that all your students learn from? And so uh, I, I rely on global education. I want to be a partner. I want our organizations, our unions, our community groups to be partners. And now's our chance. Uh, and we, we can make this case to the Biden administration. And they are listening to us. Thank you so much, Lily, for joining us. And uh, we have a big treat now. David is the person that... It will honor us by introducing our next speaker, uh, Dr. Linda Darling-Hammond. David, are you prepared? Sure. Lily, join us here for a moment. Sure. Dr. Hammond. So, Mark, um, when you asked me to, to introduce um, Dr. Linda Darling-Hammond, it was a moment of me to try to reflect and think, what could I say um, about her um, that breaks through the bio you have on your website or what people know. People know um, about leading not only the transition team for the Biden administration education, but also the Obama education uh, transition team. Um, I remember being a young grad student um, in DC when Linda Darling-Hammond gave um, the Brown lecture for AERA. I got a front row seat, I was in there two hours early I don't know of very many educationalists who bring an audience to tears and then to their feet. Lily, of course, yourself. But I mean, um, Linda, I was also thinking about the time that she and I were together in Singapore. And, you know, we were there actually with, uh, with the, the Obama's education secretary team and people like that. And Arnie was asking the Minister of Education of Singapore, so what's your secret for having such a fantastic education system here? And he pointed at Linda. She wrote our plan. She helped us think through what to do. In fact, if you go to high performing education systems anywhere in the world, the chances are more likely to see citations of Linda's work than almost any other researcher on the planet. She, we've also been working for years on the International Summits of the Teaching Profession. Um, 
it's almost inconceivable of someone that's had a more direct impact on education thinking on the profession, both nationally and globally. Um, and someone who's more humble in terms of, of that impact. I, I love the fact that she also refuses to accept the notion that teaching could be thought of as charity. And she, she fights back very strong in terms of, of a vision of the profession um, and, and what the pre profession needs in terms of getting that support unapologetically, but with research and evidence, um, teaching in America's future. I mean, was the seminal report in terms of a lot of, of really the important teacher policy uh, movement that came after that. I can list the whole alphabet soup, Mark. I can list NCATE and AACTE and AERA and, and all of those. And, but I would put EI with that. I would put UNESCO with that. So um, I just think that uh, we are so well served having um, Linda Darling Hammond thinking and leadership in terms of this transition at this moment for the United States, for California, but for the world. So without further ado, Mark, I very much uh, congratulate you for bringing our dear friend and the brilliant Linda Darling Hammond to this International Education Day and giving me the, the honor of getting to introduce her. Thank you. Thank very you much. so much, David. And welcome, welcome, Linda. And we're going to exit and we're going to come back and ask you some questions in a little bit. Thank you again. Well, thank you. I'm glad I had my video off so that I you couldn't see me blushing while David was giving that introduction. I should really stop while I'm ahead, but thank you so much, David. Uh, and I'm delighted to be here with um, everyone who is uh, really trying to figure out how to strengthen our education systems all around the world, in Minnesota, in the United States, and well beyond. Uh, I'm going to share my screen for a few minutes to talk a little bit about this issue of how do we really rethink and restart uh, education in ways that build back better. Um, some of you will recognize that as the um, uh, Biden um, theme, and it is what we've been working on in the transition. I will say two things about the transition, uh, that every transition team for this president has worked with a high sense, sense of urgency uh, around two things. One is, of course, dealing with the pandemic, uh, getting uh, everyone to a place where we are safe, where we are able to move forward in terms of um, public health, in terms of you know, our personal safety, but also to reopen schools in safe ways so that children have the benefit of all that their teachers can bring them. And the other pillar for the transition has been the pillar of racial equity and equity in all forms. And when we think about restarting and reinventing schools uh, for equitable learning, for empowering learning, uh, we wanna build on some of the most important work that's gone on in the world that David already mentioned. Uh, and that um, you know, uh, many of you have been a part of uh, doing as you innovate, as you share ideas, uh, and as we uh, really have an opportunity to use the disruption to rethink <clears throat> the systems that we're using. So it's not any um, surprise to you that we are facing a public health crisis. We're facing, of course, an associated economic crisis, uh, a civil rights crisis, certainly in the United States, but actually in many places around the world, as there is really a recognition of the deep inequalities that are surfaced at times like these and the need to correct those, and a climate crisis, which is related um, to uh, the ways in which uh, governments have behaved over you know, many, many years. Um, and I will certainly put the US government uh, at the top of that list in the last four years. One of the things about moments like these in history is that they often lead to major generational social change. And if you think back to, um, certainly if I use uh, the US history, to the 1870s in Reconstruction, 1900s with the transformation from an agrarian to an urban society and the progressive education movement that John Dewey led that went along with that. In the 1930s, in the Great Depression, we not only had uh, the Social Security Administration and many other big social policies 
inactive, but we also have the Progressive Education Association transforming schools uh, around the country. In the 1960s, uh, education innovation went alongside civil rights, activism and reforms in the 1990s. And here we are in 2020 on this 30 year cycle with these very big um, opportunities for progressive educational change. We do of course face these yawning equity chasms uh, that uh, threaten major segments of society and that focuses our attention as it must to the issues of equity and systemic racism and ways to correct uh, those long-standing challenges. We have the largest economic disparities since 1929 uh, in fact, at this moment in history, the top 1% of wage earners in the United States controls about 50% of the, more wealth than 50% of the population. Uh, that's going to need uh, corrections so that everyone can earn a living wage uh, and be part of the economy. Uh, we have had inadequate action to address the health, safety, and economic effects of the pandemic. I will say um, there has been enormous innovation around the world. And we should think about that as we also think about how to mobilize governments to take advantage of what is being learned. Um, and though both of those things live side by side. I happen to read the Journal of the American Medicine Association, Medical Association, JAMA, and the New England Journal of Medicine on a regular basis. I get them every day and there are 10 articles a day about what we're learning about COVID-19, about treatments, about um, uh, variants of the virus, about how to deal with it, about public health. The explosion of knowledge has been just incredible and the sharing of that knowledge. And the same thing is true in education. And these are moments that really trigger a renaissance in the way people behave with one another, uh, collaboratively often rather than competitively uh, with uh, innovation and invention uh, in the moment. So this is a part of the context as well. And schools we know are one of the few safety nets in many hard hit communities, offering food, offering access to uh, digital devices and the internet, organizing social services for families that have been hard hit. This uh, photo is of two little girls who are sitting outside of Taco Bell in California, trying to get access to the internet, which has become one of the symbols of the great uh, inequalities and in access to digital resources um, in our state and in many other places. And this Oakland student um, you know, told us uh, what I think many students are experiencing. Um, he said, I'm concerned about food, jobs, money, my education, racism towards Asian Pacific Islander folks is a big concern for us too. I miss being around my friends and I'm feeling really, really depressed, but I can't really tell my family. So young people are bringing a lot of trauma, uh, a lot of uh, anxiety uh, into their experience with schools and educators are responding with empathy, with strategies to support social and emotional learning and supports. Um, and this is really changing the way we think about the purposes of schools. So uh, Learning Policy Institute put out a report this last fall uh, on restarting and reinventing school. You can find it on uh, the Learning Policy Institute website. Um, and it talks about all the ways in which we should capture the innovations and the necessities that are going on now um, to reinvent school as we are really bringing students back to physical school over the coming months. Reinventing school means focusing on authentic learning and equity harnessing the knowledge of human development, learning and effective teaching that was accumulated over the last century and needed for the next. We are still in many places trying to break away from the system that was created in the early 1900s, the industrial mass education system that was put in place to put children on assembly lines that have been invented by Henry Ford um, in the auto industry to you know, uh, bureaucratize schools, uh, as Max Weber, who was a theor theorist who kind of spoke to bureaucracies noted, bureaucracies are perfected to the extent that they are dehumanized. 
And the point was that we would govern by rules, not by individual proclivities. But that has created a way of doing school in so many countries uh, that is not adequate to the moments that we have before us today. So we do know some things from the sciences of learning and development. These have been captured in some recent syntheses of the knowledge base that are really important. And I think that have been pushed aside in some cases uh, through other policies that focus on you know, the mechanisms of schooling. First, of course, relationships are the essential ingredient that catalyzes healthy development and learning. In fact, in our brains, it is the relationships that parents have with their children, that children have with other uh, children and adults that actually build brain architecture. They cause um, the way in which people put things together and learn and develop neuron connections. Uh, the uh, hormones associated with that, the uh, oxytocin that is associated with getting a hug and feeling safe and protected is also associated with building brain architecture. And similarly, um, difficult emotions uh, shut that architecture down. Children actively construct knowledge by connecting what they know to what they're learning within their cultural context. So we need to make those connections possible. As John Dewey said, we bring the child to the curriculum and the curriculum to the child. Uh, and that requires a way of knowing children deeply and connecting what we want them to learn to what they already experience and know. Learning is social, emotional, and academic. If you come into a classroom situation feeling good about the teacher, feeling trusted, uh, feeling um, excited about what there is to be learned, you learn more. And if you come into that setting with trauma, with anxiety, with other things that have happened, or with the view that you're gonna be stigmatized and stereotyped in that setting, then your brain shuts down and you learn less. So social and emotional learning is not a frill. It is actually the pathway to academic learning. Students' perceptions of their own ability influence learning. So if schools see their charge as ranking and sorting, rating and grading, telling students and everyone else who's above, who's below uh, on a unidimensional idea about achievement, they're actually impeding the learning process for students who are ranked and sorted in that way. The thing we need for schools to of course be doing is supporting students and seeing their own learning strategies, strengths, assets, and building on those as well as their talents and interests. Uh, and we need the systems of schooling, the ways in which people structure such things as funding and assessment and curriculum to reinforce that view, the view of potential and development, rather than the view of ranking, sorting, and selecting. And of course, adversity affects learning. Effective schools have to be trauma-informed and healing-focused. And we know a great deal about how trauma um, actually undermines students' learning process. But we also know that relationships um, that are strong and um, consistent uh, are also part of the healing process that allows resilience um, to occur. So this is a time, as this Atlanta parent put it, to reprioritize, to see if something can be different. As she put it, to reset the system, we have to take a loss, but we can recoup the loss if we actually get kids excited about education, create a more positive space for them to learn. Uh, this is the document I was talking about, restarting and reinventing schools. Uh, really rooted in what we know about how children learn and develop. And in that document, we identify 10 different areas of change that are interlocking, uh, that uh, take us through the elements that will allow us as policymakers, as practitioners, uh, and as stakeholders in the system to use this opportunity to create the system that will be with us, hopefully for the next 100 years. Uh, rather than trying to return to the normal that in many cases was not uh, good enough for all students. Uh, the first part of getting back to school, of course, is closing the digital divide. We've done a lot in many countries to do that. We need to take this the rest of the way so that it never reemerges again, so that the ability to be connected, uh, not only with your teachers and 
peers in your own local school district, but with uh, children and teachers around the world, as is often happening, where kids are doing projects with each other uh, across uh, global boundaries uh, and developing uh, a notion of globalism and unity in the world. Uh, that has to be part of what the instruction is when we go back to physical buildings, if we're not in them right now, and as we continue to build the system. That requires a set of policy changes as well as resource allocations. We need to strengthen blended learning in ways that allow students to engage interactively with each other uh, and with um, interactive materials that really help them learn. We've seen that there are ways that um, children can really learn more effectively in some cases with the combination, the right combination of teachers, peers, uh, and opportunities to connect with uh, ideas, research, other people, uh, and interact using these technology platforms. We need to build on that. We need to assess what students need both socially and emotionally and in their home contexts, uh, as well as academically and really use that as the basis for figuring out what to do next. And then we need to transform the teaching and learning process. Uh, that includes, of course, ensuring supports for social emotional learning. One of the things I have really uh, been thrilled to see, certainly across California, but also across uh, the US and the world, is how schools are front uh, loading and uh, prioritizing the social and emotional learning elements that at one point in many places were pushed aside, we don't have time. Uh, we now see that we must have time. We must have the opportunity to help kids think about their own uh, feelings, uh, share what they're experiencing, learn strategies for managing and coping, for interacting with each other, for taking social responsibility and engaging in the world, which gives them a sense of agency uh, and prepares them for the kind of civic engagement that we will need for them to have to turn this world around. So the uh, social and emotional learning integration uh, is happening. We need to continue that. Redesigning schools for stronger relationships, those factory model designs uh, that really minimize relationships, they were designed to do that, are changing as we figure out how we have to build smaller cohorts of children who stay with each other and with a teacher for a longer period of time so that they can be both um, safe from transmitting the virus or ready to quarantine if needed, but also we know from schools that have already redesigned that when they have these teams of teachers working with shared groups of students, when they have advisory systems that put them into close contact with adults over a period of time who can also relate to the families, when we put them into relationships that are sustained and continuous, they graduate at higher rates, they do better in school, they create stronger attachments, they have resources to help them uh, meet, meet all of the challenges that they're experiencing. So it is time now to uh, really redesign the structure of schools in the way that adults and children are brought together uh, for the work that they're doing. And then to do that while we're emphasizing authentic learning that's meaningful in the community, connected to children's experiences, that is culturally responsive, culturally affirming, culturally sustaining for them so that we're really enabling them to uh, come into school in a way that will be successful, affirming, uh, and build those connections that I talked about earlier. I've seen so many schools that are doing amazing work. Uh, one school we recently just completed a study of is Humanitas Social Justice High School in Los Angeles where uh, as COVID, uh, as they had to go into distance learning, uh, as the pandemic began in March, they were um, doing project-based learning already. They decided to study COVID in their community uh, and they studied exponential functions and how do you understand the curve and what's happening and how to bend the curve of, of uh, infection rates, uh, tracking it statistically in their community and math, uh, looking from a scientific perspective at the virus and the biology of these kinds of um, uh, pandemics 
um, not only this one, but other ones looking uh, from a history social science perspective at what was happening in the community, um, what was happening to jobs, to families, whose families are <clears throat> being uh, affected and how that was affecting the community, uh, writing about it, um, helping people in the community understand uh, what's going on as well, using their English language arts skills, um, doing all of that bilingually. So really taking a, an integrated approach to helping students use the experience um, to gain both academic skills and a sense of uh, agency in the moment. Uh, we see this kind of work you know, in so many schools and educators inventing and sharing those inventors, inventions. And then of course we need to prepare educators and engage educators in reinventing schools. Uh, as is beginning to happen in so many places across the country. I've noted the centrality of social emotional learning, which not only includes those areas of um, learning about particular skills, but also the growth mindset that allows people to be resilient, which is supported in schools when uh, teachers take a strategy of uh, providing the opportunity to engage in uh, serious work getting feedback about that work, continuing to revise that work so that it is more and more um, expert uh, so that students always see that I can get better at what I'm doing and I have the opportunity to grow and to demonstrate that growth. And when we do that, we know we get greater achievement, graduation rates, improved college and career ready skills. We also have a moment where some people are responding with the old strategies. Let's test all the kids. Let's identify who's above, who's below, who's on grade level. Let's put them into different tracks and different groups. Uh, and then we'll remediate some and you know, kind of drill them on what they've missed and others will allow to move forward. Uh, some people have even said, let's hold back whole cohorts of children um, in school. We have a lot of evidence that uh, grade retention and remediation structured that way do not end up uh, producing higher achievement. They do produce more discouragement, more disengagement, and higher dropout rates in the end. So we need to support educators to learn how to take advantage of the gains that can be made uh, as students learn in inquiry-based heterogeneous groups. And there are a number of strategies that um, are just examples of the many that are available to use cooperative learning in what's called complex instruction to uh, really enable students to accelerate their learning um, in this moment. Um, U-cubed is a math, uh, a math education strategy that has had enormous success with millions of children and um, thousands of teachers across the United States and in the world. Uh, that use some of those strategies and ways of teaching mathematics that are authentic and engaging and produce strong achievement gains, especially for students who have been furthest from opportunity. Expeditionary learning is another example in the English language arts. Uh, the point is that there are ways that we want to support building a community of learners who engage in serious inquiry together, using what we know about how people learn uh, to address what people worry about as the learning loss uh, of this moment. I want to just note that children are always learning. Um, and even the studies that have been done, quote, on learning loss have said kids are continuing to progress, but not always in the same rates on the traditional school curriculum. But meanwhile, they are learning things about how to take care of their families, how to survive in a context like this, how to be resilient how to be resourceful. There are all kinds of things that we need to tap in the learning that children have undertaken. And then we need to support educators uh, as they learn about the ways to support all the areas of children's development, social, emotional, cognitive, how to create the kind of inquiry-based curriculum that supports the whole child's progress and develop the skills for trauma-informed and healing-oriented practice. And we know that teacher learning happens the same way that student learning happens. We need to create experiences uh, for teachers where they can see in practice 
uh, what it is that they are seeking to learn uh, for teachers who are in training and those who are also engaged in professional development. Uh, we need to allow teachers to get access to each other uh, so that they can share their expertise, uh, develop the relationships and professional communities of practice that enable change. Uh, and to do that, we need to rethink time and resources. We need to both provide expanded learning time for children and expanded learning time for teachers. Uh, we need to establish community schools and wraparound supports so that children are taken care of in every way. Uh, in the school environment, we've seen how community schools have really uh, been able to uh, make sure that all children are getting what they need and families are connected to schools. Uh, these are not the schools that are losing access to kids. They're the schools that are making the connections even stronger. And then of course, we have to leverage adequate and equitable school funding in every country of the world and in every uh, community uh, within each country. And that's gonna be a major agenda over this coming decade. So I wanna close by just noting that there are a lot of innovations that are going on for us to build on as we rethink and reinvent schooling. We have new uses for technology for learning that have opened up all kinds of vistas. I think about in Long Beach, uh, California, where they realized that with technology, um, students could get access to teachers that they would not otherwise get to study with and teachers could see each other teach. So they opened up classes uh, and some of the master teachers in that district had 2000 kids attending uh, you know, a class and other teachers tuning in and then creating a community of those teachers to share strategies uh, for um, using technology for learning. Lots of ways in which we can uh, very purposefully benefit from what we've learned if we share it. New attention to social emotional learning and student welfare, we've got to keep that at the center. Uh, there are families now that are working one-on-one -on -one with educators, um, including for students who are special education students now having their families engaged in knowing what helps them learn and helping enact that set of strategies. Uh, what a great gift that will be if we continue those ways of working. New approaches to assessment, which are focusing now on formative and diagnostic assessment uh, for the purpose of supporting learning rather than uh, focusing particularly on summative assessments for the purpose primarily of ranking and sorting children uh, or schools. New ways to group students and adults to be in strong relationship with each other. Uh, students have more time when they are also on their own, autonomously following up on their learning, doing their research, um, engaging with materials. Uh, it turns out that you don't have to babysit children every hour of the day, uh, particularly as they get older, um, to uh, enable them to learn. And that's also opened up new time for teacher collaboration. We have a lot of districts now where in the United States, um, if Monday and Tuesday are uh, days where kids are online and Thursday and Friday they're in the building, Wednesday is a teacher development day and a day where teachers are working with one another. We found that eight hours of differential time for teachers that was missing in most American schools. And this is true in some other countries around the world. Uh, we need to keep it uh, along with the new pedagogies that are enabling this kind of growth and the new ways of collaborating that we are developing across classrooms and schools and even countries. So I know that this is a challenging time and it is out of these moments of challenge that we really see um, great changes occurring. And I'm reminded of the words of Robert Kennedy, who noted that it is from numberless diverse acts of courage and belief that human history is shaped. Each time someone stands up for an ideal or acts to improve the lot of others or strikes out against injustice, he sends forth a tiny ripple of hope and crossing each other from a million different centers of energy and daring those ripples build a current which can sweep down the mightiest walls of oppression and resistance. Uh, this is in fact what's happening among educators. 
um, within and across countries right now. Uh, and we need to understand that each time we take a step uh, to dare to think differently about how to support our children, that ripple of hope has effects all across the world. Thank you. Wow, Dr. Darling Hammond, this was so overview and uh, giving us not just a global look, but a look inside of the, what the profession is doing, what the learners are doing, what they're saying, what the parents. Uh, it's a very, very complete picture. And I appreciate David's story and his introduction of why the people in Singapore were so uh, excited and so anxious to say, you, Dr. Darling Hammond, help them build really one of the premier public education systems on the planet. I want to circle back on, on this a little point about that because I have had the great pleasure of watching a number of the interviews and postings in Edutopia. Uh, you were one of the participants in that amazing uh, ongoing look at where is education going, what can we be doing, et cetera. But uh, one that was um, caught my eye was this question of international competitiveness, partly because Global Minnesota is always thinking about connecting Minnesotans to the world and the world to Minnesota. That's how we operate. And you made the point that um, consistently we've been way down the ranks in terms of how our education system prepares us, all of us, for this global economy. A lot of different things in that global economy, but some of them have to do with language and communication. Some of them have to do with relationships. Some of them have to do with skills in particular types of technology or particular types of ways of thinking. But you, um, you spoke in that uh, uh, Edutopia event about things that we could do that would move us up and make us more engaged and more successful in the international economy, in the international community. And it seems like that's part of building back better. Is there some guidance or ideas or some things to point to that could get us moving forward on that international side of preparing all of us, including our younger learners, for that future economy, <clears throat> not for the one that's been easily decimated by this pandemic. Yeah. Well, there's so many things to think about there. One is, of course, we want to be part of the international community, which we haven't been over the last four years, and we need to re-enter the international community. Uh, and you know, that was something that um, when the Obama administration came in had to be done as well. And we re-engaged with OECD and we re-engaged with the countries that were holding summits together to say, how do we understand education? And we began to be able to learn from other countries what their strategies are. And that's of course critically important. Um, there are a couple of things that we can learn from others. Uh, and of course we need to act on now. And uh, there is a real, uh, strong, as I mentioned, a really strong equity agenda in the Biden administration. But one of the things that we do differently than other high achieving countries is we fund education so unequally. And we have such a tattered safety net for children. So we have the highest poverty rate of children in the industrialized world by a very large margin. Uh, and uh, we don't have universal health care. We don't have the support systems for children and families to ensure the kids are well taken care of, uh, both in schools and out of schools. Our funding systems for education are very unequal. We spend three times more in the wealthiest state than we do in the uh, lowest funded state. And then within states, we spend three times more in the highest funded districts than in the lowest funded districts. That's got to end. That is you know, an antiquated notion of how to structure an education system that um, really holds us back. If you look at the um, data from things like the PISA tests, uh, and if you look at um, schools in which, in the United States, in which fewer than 10% of children live in poverty, which is more analogous to others in the world, we rank number one in reading. Uh, and if you even look at schools where fewer than 25% of kids live in poverty, we're number three in reading in the world. Um, and that's way more kids in poverty than any of the other industrialized countries have. 
Uh, we have almost one in four kids living in poverty, growing homelessness, all the rest of the, you know, strat you know the, the challenges that um, kids experience. Uh, the, where we fall down is the growing number of schools that are high poverty, concentrated, high poverty, segregated, typically um, more than 90% African-American and Latinx students, which are under-resourced. Uh, and those schools, you know, do much less well because they don't have the resources that they need to deal with the um, uh, needs that the children have. Uh, we don't have universal pre-K, uh, all of these things. So one of the things we can learn from other countries is how to organize our system so it is truly equitable, so that it has the on-ramp that's needed. And I hope in these next few years, we'll also see ways to wrap around um, children with healthcare for all, with universal pre-K as part of the Biden agenda with uh, changes in school funding systems so that there is in fact the opportunity to learn from not only the great teaching that goes on in the United States against the odds, uh, but also the efforts of other countries. Well, it feels like that concept of the wraparound is that, that larger picture, the, both the individual attention to learners and the kind of universal attention, the wraparound, love, attention, all of the elements of a society taking care of each other, families taking care of each other in, in all of this. It seems like you have a message that's a message that's um, uh, for the whole society to take into their hearts, into their minds, into their souls, in terms of how are we um, being responsible, sustainable, resilient? How are we being loving, a loving community, a blessed community? Uh, in your the couple minutes that we still have left after you've been giving us this incredible global picture, what's your one piece of advice for the, I don't know, maybe a couple thousand people watching from all over the planet about uh, you know how we get ourselves up the next day and keep moving, moving things forward in the right direction. Well, there's never only one thing, right? <laughs> because we have exactly. to think about how everything relates to everything else. Um, but you know, I think I take hope and inspiration from the um, people I work with, from the educators I work with, who are. Uh, you know, just extraordinary people uh, who see this, who are in this work, not for the salary, you know, because <laughs> if that were the case, they didn't, you know, look ahead at the salary schedule. They're, they're here because they care about uh, other people, about building the next generation, about wrapping around children, giving them what they need. And um, I think when we have governments, as we sometimes do, in different countries around the world, and I think we're about to have one in the United States, uh, that really also have that frame of reference. It's a time for educators to speak up and to be both politically active and educationally active uh, about what's needed, what works, how do we do it, um, to really help those who are in the policy community understand uh, as many want, many of them want to make the right kinds of changes, what it will take to do that. The other thing is that whenever we undertake major changes in societies and, and do reforms of education, and many of us have been through eras of reform, you know, there's always the possibility for a good idea to go bad. That you know, we have an idea and then somebody you know um, mandates it and people who receive it don't necessarily understand it or don't have the resources to do it. And then some pale shadow of what we had hoped would happen happens. So one of the things that's gonna be so important for members of the education community is to share their knowledge with each other, to share their expertise with each other. If you've you know, been one of those people who's helped to start a community school that is succeeding in wrapping around the children and really enabling them to succeed, Think about all the ways that you can help others who are gonna start that process. Learn what it is that you have had the opportunity to learn 
uh, as you've innovated in the classroom and pedagogy, uh, how do we build the collaborative capacity of everyone in the profession to share what they're learning and uh, help others take those next steps? I think that's going to be just critically important. Well, it's inspiring for me to hear and to think about this. And it uh, also makes me think uh, some about my mother, who was a teacher at a very young age. And I was born and that, among other things, disrupted that post-World War II teaching. Uh, but later on, she went back to college when I did. And we graduated the same day. Oh. She went on to be an yeah. elementary teacher, and I was not very successful in being a high school social studies teacher. But when she later in life went back to school again and became a principal, she said, I want to do the best job possible. But when I retire, I want to be out helping those student teachers that are learning, that are in yeah. placed in schools in that last. And I had remembered that scary first day of my placement. Yeah. And what I realized is that there's something about true teachers, people with the teacher's heart that is in it to share and to learn forever and to share and to be part of that, making things better for all. Yeah. And you today have given us an incredible example of what that looks like from a very thoughtful point of view. And you've inspired us to think about how we can be part of wrapping around, of speaking up, of sharing successes, of not being afraid of saying, you know, that might have been good then, but now things have changed or it didn't quite work out. But what I'm grateful for is that both your work in the transition and your leadership right now with the California School Board, you're in the trenches making change happen. I feel like the future will be brighter and now we have the kind of support from a higher level in government, but it's going to take the knitting together of ideas and people like you've been doing, whether it's to folks in Singapore or folks in Oakland or folks right here in Minnesota and around the world. Thank you so much for being with us here today. Thank you for making all those Edutopia tapes. People should go watch those. <laughs> and I look forward to our next opportunity to together keep making a brighter future for our learners, for the educators, and for all of us as we go into this next period where we have an opportunity to actually build back better. Thank you so much. Thank you. Pleasure to be family. with you. Thank Take you. care. We're moving into the final segment of our morning, and we're moving from the national and the international to one of the most important of the local leaders here in Minnesota, but a national voice. Uh, Sandra Samuels is the founder and uh, president CEO of the Northside Achievement Zone, which is one of the promised neighborhoods in the nation. Uh, but it grew out of, uh, uh, I would say, a very important but unusual uh, path where there was an organization, the Peace Foundation, uh, created to try to deal with the question of gun violence and violence and the deaths that were so prevalent. And this whole notion that finding peace requires finding a new path so that our children are surrounded by all of the things they need to be successful has led to one of the nation's most honored and in incredibly well supported in the sense of people saying, yes, here's the right way to do it. And that has been because Sandra Samuels had a vision of what it meant to really love all of our children and then to really prepare them and support them to be ready so that they could be all set to go, whether it was college or what part of life. I'm so thrilled, Sandra, that you could be with us here today and very, very happy to take you, give you this opportunity and to hear that story of how Northside Achievement Zone is moving us ahead and building things back better. Yes, thank you. Well, Mark, so great to be here with you and with the international community. What an amazing day, the International Day of Education. I mean, I, I, I just like, I, I didn't even know it existed. And so I feel doubly honored 
uh, to be a part of it. And so um, as Mark um, mentioned, I am Sandra Samuels, president and CEO of the Northside Achievement Zone. Uh, we are located in North Minneapolis and um, Minnesota. And, and I do, I wanna talk to you about um, what we're doing to address as a community, an, a, a different approach um, to education and to supporting education. Um, and, and we did have a way, we didn't start that way. We started addressing violence as, as Mark just mentioned. And so what I wanna do is I wanna show you a video of Promise Neighborhood. So you'll get a grounding in terms of who we are. Um, and then I'm gonna go backwards and tell you how we began, how we had this evolution from a violence prevention organization to one that um, was based in community uh, and, and the power of place in supporting schools and families um, to, uh, to educate all of our children. And, um, and so I have a video I wanna show you. And before that, I always like to do a little bit of poetry um, as part of my presentations. And I um, am a Hamilton geek. And there's, there's one song, uh, Dear Theodosia, if any of you have seen it internationally, and I know there's all kinds of things around classism, you know, who could afford it? But anyway, um, Dear Theodosia, and uh, Hamilton and his nemesis are talking about their children, their very young children and our very young country. And um, in the United States, certainly when you put us up against China, we are still um, just a twinkle in our parents' eye, you know, in, in terms of the time we've been alive. But I'm not singing. Um, you'll come of age with our young nation. We'll bleed and fight for you. We'll make it right for you. And if we lay a strong enough foundation, we'll give the world to you, we'll pass it on to you, and you'll blow us all away. Someday, someday, you'll blow us all away. And, uh, and I, I truly believe that. And, and I just, I, I, I believe that foundationally, their children don't come in pieces. There's so many things they need, uh, including education, um, but we education is a solid foundation upon which a child grows and develops and comes into his or her own, um, her own efficacy. So let me show you um, a little video about two Promise Neighborhoods. So we're a Promise Neighborhood, the Northside Achievement Zone. And there's also a Promise Neighborhood in Kentucky, Berea, Kentucky, that I want to share with you as well. And Promise Neighborhoods was a program that was created by the Obama administration in 2010. And the intention was his administration said, we've got to do something innovative in terms of education. And you heard the speaker before in here, and, and you know there's been so many uh, different um, types of education reform. This one was steeped in community, and he wanted to model to replicate the Harlem Children's Zone. Because in Harlem, they had this experiment where you know over a thousand formerly thought of as uneducable kids were going away to four-year colleges, graduating, and then coming back to Harlem and helping to rebuild uh, the fabric of community. And so when Obama became president, he said, why should you, there just be one community where a promise is being made? Because in Harlem, they had a promise, Acad they have Promise Academy. He said, um, um, every community should, should make a promise to its children. And so um, he promised to replicate Harlem Children's Zone in 21 neighborhoods, which he did when he got elected. Um, and we were one of those neighborhoods that was selected because of our um, focus on education and all of the wraparound supports. Um, and Berea, Kentucky was also a community that was selected. And that was in 20, we got selected in 2011, Berea, Kentucky in 2010, they were part of our 2011 implementation um, group as well. $28 million for five years to build up what you're about to see in both our neighborhoods. Okay, and I, I've, um, let's see, I need to get access to sharing my screen. There we go. Thank you. Coming up. 
The achievement gap basically is showing that a high percentage of our children of color do not succeed in school, do not graduate high school, compared to white children. The education gap is real, the housing gap is real, the employment gap is real, the mental health gap is real, this stuff is real. Minnesota usually is one, two, or third in the country in ACT scores. We're worst in graduating kids of color. And it's important because this is the future of our workforce. So that's the problem. And the question is, if that is the problem, what's the most effective way, not just to close the gap, but to prevent the gap? So the Northside Achievement Zone is a collaborative of 33 community-based organizations and eight schools. And we are working together in a results-driven fashion, holistic approach to end multi-generational poverty using education and whole family support as the two levers. Then the parents partner with the family coach who works with them to set specific goals for their family. That family coach connects them to our NAS parenting education classes and to our 44 partner organizations who support them to achieve their goals around education, housing, jobs, and health. At the same time, the student works one-on-one -on -one with a NAS academic coach to set their own goals for academic success. And where the NAS strategy really makes a difference is that as all this is happening, we're constantly gathering data and measuring their success. And we use that data to make sure all the pieces are working together to support families as they lift themselves out of poverty and move their children along a path to college. To have NAS to be able to bring all those different resources to the table instead of having to contact all these individual locations and the family coach working with this family to help them navigate housing, to help them navigate employment, helps to stabilize a family. They build a great network, a great group of partners, and literally neighborhood by neighborhood, they're making a difference today. They're our future workforce, and this is future economic prosperity for our region. So yes, it's the right thing to do, but it's the smart thing to do for the economic future of our community. My neighbors who live on my block are not the same as they were yesterday. And they are believing that it is possible that their outcomes for their families themselves and for our community can be vastly different than they are today. Because NAS is not looking at an individual person, they're looking at the whole family. And it starts within the family. There is not one solution. And so what we've done through the Northside Achievement Zone is we've brought together a myriad of solutions. And we brought them together for the same family and the same children. And it is worth it. Knox County has a very high poverty rate, unemployment rate for adults. A large majority of the population here receives government assistance to live on. We have communities where the median income in 1970 is actually higher than it is now. And during that same time period, the rest of the nation, the median income is doubled. So we're getting left behind in Appalachia. And when parents and grandparents and caregivers are dealing with all this other stuff, it's often the child and their, their educational journey that's, gets, that's gotten forgotten. I know some friends that are in homes that are just really unstable. There's drugs, there's arguments all the time. Students come to school with a, a lot on their minds. They have a lot of issues at home and they're not always focused and ready to learn because of that. Your role as a teacher kind of shifts. Of course you want them to learn in the classroom and you do everything you can to help them, but you also want them to feel loved. You want them to be encouraged. Almost every health statistic that's out there is not really good in this eastern Kentucky area. So anything we can do to start establishing a culture of healthy eaters, exercising, and just the mental, physical, and emotional health stability would be great. All of those factors coming together have created a place that is hard to live in. But the piece that doesn't speak to is that it's also a place that we love and we want to be able to stay here. Programs like Promise Neighborhood brings the community together around how do we make this a better place? How do we create more opportunities? How do we work with residents to recreate Appalachia?
We have some very committed school partners. We work with three school districts, Knox County, Corbin Independent, and Barberville Independent. The more that we can have for our students with all these great programs and initiatives from Bria College, Promise Neighborhood, Health Corps, FAST program, gear up. We're able to reach out to our community and we can bring all those resources to help them further their education and become more career and college ready. Hi, I, I hear that the video wasn't on. You just heard it. <laughs> Sorry, I don't know. I don't know what happened there. Uh, I'm gonna, um, but, but you did hear about how um, our work is happening. I apologize. I don't know why the video wasn't showing. Um, what I do want to do now is also share a PowerPoint that really talks a lot more about uh, the work. And, and I am so excited to be a Promise Neighborhood and to work with communities like Berea, Kentucky, because what we're talking about, many of the things that, um, that they talked about in Berea are very similar to what we face in Minneapolis. And what you're getting is really a, a good swath of the entire United States. Um, um, a, a urban community, which is North Minneapolis, and a rural community, which is Berea, Kentucky. Um, uh, Kentucky is more, is part of the Southern states. And so um, addressing, all of us addressing some of the disparities that happen in a place and knowing that the solutions need to come from that place. And again, it really builds on what the previous speaker talked about in terms of, it's not just education when you're talking about, talking about places that have been um, so isolated, disinvested in, um, and, and left behind. It's social emotional supports. It's all the wraparound supports. It's making sure children feel loved. Now, all children need it, but particularly when you're talking about children who are steeped in uh, generational poverty. So the mission of the Northside Achievement Zone is to end multi-generational poverty, building a culture of achievement in North Minneapolis, where all low-income children graduate of color, graduate from high school, college, and career ready. And we accomplish it through a collaboration with parents, community organizations, and schools, and the scholars themselves. What we know is that schools cannot do it alone. If they could, they would have by now. And as we look at this time that we're in um, with this great opportunity that, 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 that the pandemic has afforded us and the civil unrest to reimagine how we do education, it becomes more important that we are united in the way that we are educating our children. And ultimately our vision is that we would have a prosperous North Minneapolis where all of our children of color are healthy, and they graduate, um, uh, they healthy, secure academically and academically successful, ultimately realizing their unlimited potential. And I want to ever so quickly, Mark talked about the fact that we started with addressing um, uh, violence. That's what led us to education. And I wanna say um, a little bit about that. I wanna say a little bit about that. Um, just a moment. So this is where it started for us, um, the children. It's always about the children. If children are at the center, not the adults of, of the education transformation that we are all engaged in and our commitment to our children, there is no way we can't succeed. And I'm gonna talk about it later that too often our policies and our practices more so cater to the adults than they do the children. And we don't have an, a, a child problem, we have an adult problem. And I'm including myself because community leaders, uh, politicians, teachers, um, union officials, business people, neighbors, the store owner, we all have an investment in our children. Um, uh, screen here is showing um, a number of the children who were murdered in between 2000, like 2011, I'm sorry, 2005 and 2011. Um, this was the reason we started the Peace Foundation. These children here, I could even call out names um, of the children. And this is just one page. I have many, many pages, but this is the reason we started the Peace Foundation. Um, my husband and I, 
um, and a partner of ours named Michelle Martin, who's white. We're from inner city, North Minneapolis. She was from a more well-heeled white part of white Minneapolis. And we decided that we wanted to come together across difference and create a foundation um, public engagement and community empowerment, a movement that would bring our entire city together to bear on the violence that was really gripping not just North Minneapolis, but many places um, throughout our city, but disproportionately in North Minneapolis. In fact, in, um, in 1996, Minneapolis was dubbed Murderapolis. And right now we're starting to see the same high levels of violence, um, the pandemic, then the murder of George Floyd and all of the, the civil unrest, the rioting, the looting, the closure of our uh, many of our businesses, burning down of businesses. Um, the, uh, our, our city council announced that they want to defund and dismantle the police. All of this is adding the pandemic with kids not having their safety net of school, going there, being able to eat, be safe, go to after school programs. I mean, they've been on shutdown with all of the the crisis that we have been in as a society and they're, they're impacted most. And that's what we found with the Peace Foundation. This is, and so we came together, black, white, different parts of the city. And, um, and we would, this is a, 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 a piece across the North side. Whenever, uh, every year we would have like a thousand people come and just lock hands in a sign of solidarity that we were going to promote peace in our city. And, um, and it was such a show of force. I mean, across all kinds of backgrounds and faiths and religions, the commitment to end violence. That's, um, you can see it on the left there, a long line. And it just, it was as far as the eye could see. On the right, we had our youth engaged in sports activities with adults. One of our previous mayors, R.T. Ryback, is, is in this um, shot as well. But we really wanted to engage the youth to address the, um, the lack of peace in the neighborhood. Um, we would have petting zoos at places where the violence was strongest. We'd identify those places and that's where the community would descend. And again, across race, across class, across religion, that was the, the, the bedrock of it. And this is an example of a petting zoo that we had set up. And the police were a central part of the work that we did. You know, I, I always say we absolutely have to transform um, our system of policing. And there are good cops who want to do their jobs every day and actually be peace officers. And those are the ones that we worked with at the Peace Foundation. And we know that there's work that needs to happen. I don't wanna digress, um, but we also know that we have something to build on. We're not starting from zero. Um, our, we did a, a peace games every summer. We had a big events, races, and um, just you name it, art crawls across the community, as you can see there. And one thing that we did that was really important, whenever a young person died, we would have a vigil. And this is a picture of a vigil, and we were praying over someone. I think there's a little one in the middle there. Um, because we felt like we needed to go back to the places of pain and to, to reclaim those places by the community coming in and saying, you are loved and you are valued. This place is loved, this place is valued and you're not alone as a community. It was a powerful thing. And we saw violence go down in a significant way, but it never stayed down. We'd have great um, years and, and we'd be written about in the paper. But the thing that we learned, and here's where education comes in and how we transformed into the Northside Achievement Zone. Every time we buried a young person, we would find out like what were his or her aspirations. We wanted to lift them up as human beings more than what the newspaper said. And invariably it was they had, you know, typically no kind of um, um, college aspirations, maybe to play sports, maybe to, to be in the entertainment industry. And we started seeing this connection to the violence, both in those who were murdered and those who were murdering, of, of this sense of hopelessness in terms of the future. And the one key denominator, well, two, was like real dysfunction in terms of the community and families. And I live in North Minneapolis with my family and, and three daughters. And so we, we saw it up close. In fact, it's why we live here. And, um, but we saw the connection to education. That's why in 2008, about 30 Northside partners, housing, career, health, 
um, early childhood schools, after school uh, programs, colleges came together and said, let's start one system, effective system of support across many partners. We call it e pluribus unum is how we came up with Northside Achievement Zone. And it is a wraparound support. And this is a, um, a diagram of a model. It's two generations. We work with both the parents and the scholars. We call all the baby scholars. And many of our families get a family achievement coach that you see at the bottom of the screen, hired full time from the community to connect our families to our system of support. And that is again in housing, career, health, early childhood K through 12 colleges. And then we have a whole host of parenting education classes. And one of our classes is called College Bound Babies. And it's for parents who have children zero to three. And they learn all about brain development, positive discipline, what it takes to get your child ready for kindergarten on their trek to college. And when the parents graduate, the babies graduate too. And we give them college t-shirts that say college graduate and the year that they'll graduate from a four-year college. And for us, getting at that belief gap is critical. And it's something that has been transforming the expectation of our parents and our scholars in the zone. We've done an all-out marketing effort. But anyway, and we track data. And I'm going to share some data with you um, before um, we're done to show that NAS is working. And we're focused on results. We measure outcomes. We measure our partnership. We work on getting better at getting better and transforming our community through data and learning. And the end game for us, again, is Northside prosperity. And, and we target those who are most left behind. So this is North Minneapolis is disproportionately African-American, disproportionately low income. Um, we have been um, disinvested in. We have a disproportionate share of failing schools. Um, there are no um, 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 big jobs here. Um, our transportation system is lacking. I mean, I could go on and go on, but this is the makeup of our families in NAS. We have uh, close to 1,000 families, and 74% uh, of them make $30,000 or less. 90% um, are families of color and 78% are uh, African-American. So that for us is the sweet spot. <clears throat> and so what we, their progress and our progress as a ecosystem that's supporting them um, and we change what doesn't work in real time. We have a results process to do that. Our team of staff are co-located across our partner sites and, um, um, and they partner with parents and scholars and, and, and partner staff. So this is the real e pluribus unum. And right now, since the pandemic, of course, and the schools have been out, our staff are all uh, sheltering in place, um, but the schools are going back in. And what we've created is we've created a team around our scholars. So this is team Jaquan. And, um, and so the parents and our partners and the coach we surround Jaquan. So, so if Jaquan was ever thinking that he didn't have a support system, if he ever wondered about whether he should join a gang or not, we say to him, we're your gang. And this is um, an example of that team approach that we have around all of our scholars. And here's some of the data. The data says that NAS is working. This is over a four year trend in both reading and math. And what you're seeing is the longer NAS scholars are in NAS, the better they do in reading and math. In fact, when they come to us, 18% in reading, 9% in math with this cohort, and you can see what it is four years later, and they remain in our same schools. Um, this is also looking at NAS, more NAS is better when they have a coach that I talked about earlier, and they're in one of our partner schools. Um, the purple is a coach and in one of our partner schools getting the academic strategies, and the gray is a coach only. So we know that the layered approach is what absolutely works. And then early childhood and, you know, again, kindergarten readiness by the high school is a lagging indicator about whether we've educated our kids or not, right? Kindergarten, whether they're ready for kindergarten is really key. And this is, we've been able to, as NAS, to, um, to, to get many of our scholars into high quality 
early learning centers. And so the PEAT shows the number of early childhood scholars we have. And again, we call all our baby scholars to get at that belief gap. And then the gray are the high quality centers that they're in. And then the red are um, early um, childhood scholarships that NAS has been able to provide the families. And that's something that we constantly raise money for because we know how important it is. The first uh, um, uh, thousand days of a child's life, 80% of the brain is developed and, that, and, and everything is, is kind of scaffold and, and, and um, really shapes whether a child is ready for kindergarten. This is just showing some of our early childhood partners and the kindergarten readiness rate. Um, we're really excited. Our partners are all high quality and the children are definitely showing up at uh, kindergarten ready to learn. So I'm gonna start to bring this to a close and just say, you know, after me, you're gonna hear from two men that I absolutely adore and highly respect. And they're gonna be talking about education policy. And I wanted to say some things about that before we're done, because no matter with everything that we're faced with right now, especially how COVID has peeled back the colors, covers of the disparities, the, the deep disparities across race and across class in this country, the murder of George Floyd, I keep saying that it's not a coincidence that it happened here in Minneapolis. Um, it is an, it's like an iceberg and, and George Floyd's murder was just the tip of the racist iceberg that is that happens here in Minnesota because we have some of the biggest racial disparities around education. Um, in Minneapolis, whereas only 22% of black children read at grade level, 80% of white children do. In home ownership, 75% of white families own their own home only 25% of black families do. In terms of income, um, the, the median income for a black family is 36,000 across the state. It's 80,000 for white families. So 83,000, excuse me. So there are so, and then COVID itself, so many disparities. And so we can do all the great work on the ground that's possible. But if our policies, if our policies do not work for our children, not the adults, then we will always um, take steps back. We will never ever truly educate all of our kids. And I'm gonna highlight one policy around teacher effectiveness, for example. I could, I could highlight a lot of policies. And again, this is not just about schools, but this is what schools can do and must do. And, and we work on what parents need to do, what communities need to do, um, what scholars need to do. That's what we're doing in community and we are depending on schools doing what they can do. So according to Minneapolis Public Schools, the teacher is the most important factor impacting a child's education. Any of you who are parents, you know that, you were students, uh, you, you know that as well. If a child has a high performing teacher for one year, they enjoy incredible advantages years out. Negative effects on, uh, in terms of poor performing teachers on student achievement persist for years. One bad teacher and then one good teacher. Um, low achieving students are more likely to be in classrooms with lower, uh, 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 lower performing teachers. This is an example of tenure of, of experience of a teacher. Bethune Community School is in North Minneapolis. Lake Harriet is in Southwest, a more affluent part of Minneapolis. And as you can see, we have 79% black children. Lake Harriet has 24. And just go down the grade to who is proficient in reading. Only 28% of black students are at Bethune. 88% of students at Lake Harriet are proficient. And look at the difference in years. Six years for the average teacher experience in North Minneapolis, 24 years for Southwest. Now we know that it's not just experience, and I'm gonna skip over this. We know that it's not just experience, that does it, you have to have a teacher that loves children, that's innovating and so on, but we know that experience matters. And so we should have a diverse school of new teachers, teachers of color, so on and so forth. So some of the things that, that I believe need to happen are changing the, the teacher contract provisions so that we actually can have more equitable distribution because one of the things that prevents that is the teachers union and their contract. And I love teachers, this is not bashing, I just wanna keep it 100 as our parents always say, then we need to incentivize teachers and pay them for teaching in schools um, in, in communities that other teachers don't want to. That's why they're stacked in the well-resourced parts of uh, Minneapolis. And then invest in the school communities in terms of the wraparound and things of that nature. 
And I and and you're about to hear. And I could go on about. Um, I could go on about policies. You're about. It's so important. It, policies in America have shaped me, shaped my family. Their inability to get an education. Then Brown versus Board of Education that 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 said no. All children deserve a quality education. I wouldn't be where I am if it were not for Brown versus Board of Education. And, and I can name a number of other policies. You're about to hear about one that's really important. In closing, I just wanna say this. I got an email from a, a lawyer, a professor from Yale named Paul Gewertz, and he clerked for Justice um, um, Thurgood Marshall. And he said he was investing in NAS, he sent us some money, and he said because he felt like we were living the embodiment of what Justice um, Marshall's life was all about. And I just wanna say this, and I'm gonna close, because I think this is really what we need right now. One, aspe one aspect of Marshall's achievement is rarely emphasized. This is what Paul said about um, um, Justice uh, Marshall. To do what he did required an heroic imagination he grew up in a ruthlessly discriminatory world, a world in which segregation of the races was pervasive and taken for granted, where lynching was common, where the black man's inherent inferiority was proclaimed widely and wantonly. Thurgood Marshall had the capacity to imagine a radically different world, the imaginative capacity to believe that such a world was possible, the strength to sustain that image in the mind's eye and the heart's longing and the courage and ability to make that imagined world real. The predicate for the great achievement of Brown versus Board of Education was to imagine something better than the present, to resist the acquiescence, passivity, fear, and accommodation that, that overcome so many, to defy an insistent reality with imagination and then to fight for what was imagined. We're at that time in our history where we have an opportunity to, to reimagine what education looks like. It's gonna take all of us. And I'm so honored to be in the fight with all of you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sandra. And I've been there for those little tiny foot and a half tall scholars getting their shirts with their- yeah. You have Mark. Oh yes, and you know, um, you know, it. Everything about the kind of arc that you described, and the peace, and the violence, and I mean, all these things are still with us. But Justice, you know, Marshall Thurgood Marshall's words, interpreted by his clerk, are the same ones that we have to use to both get us up tomorrow, but also to have that create giving that creativity and that vision permission yes. and our next uh, two presenters who you know well um you know justice alan page he and his wife diane were visionaries back in 1988 creating that page education foundation and beginning to say we're going to help make this possible and of course he's um you know was a not just an all pro, very unusually successful football player, but a fantastic state Supreme Court justice. Yes. And his partnership with the president of the Minneapolis Federal Reserve, Neil Kashkari, to say, <clears throat> say out loud, our constitution of the state should require as a right, quality education is now a deep subject and we are having a big public debate on it. And so you've given us the inspiration to begin that next conversation. We know that it is part of creating a policy and that's gonna be the policies that make the future. But having once been a politician, I also know that it's people who make the policies. Thurgood Marshall and others, uh, Diane and Alan Page in their own way and Justice Page now and Neil Kashkari. Thank you so much for joining us and please welcome to the screen, Justice Page and uh, President Kashkari. Thank you so much for joining us here today. I'm turning the floor over to you uh, to uh, bring our viewers, maybe a couple thousand around the planet um, into your thinking about the right to quality education. Well, thank you, Mark. It's, uh, my name is Neil Kashkari. I'm president 
of the Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis. I'm really pleased to be here with all of you. And thank you, Sandra, for your uh, kickoff, for your, your inspiring work. It's great to be with you and it's great to be your friend. Uh, I'll just start very briefly and then I'm gonna turn it over to Alan. I've been president of the Minneapolis Fed for five years. One of my big surprises moving to Minnesota was to discover these terrible education achievement gaps that Sandra just talked about. And I challenged our researchers at the Minneapolis Fed to help me understand why they exist. Why are they there? What has been done to try to close them? And what can we learn from looking around the United States, looking around the country? What have other states done? And what we've learned is in the past 30 years, there have been many good faith attempts in Minnesota to improve education outcomes for all of our children. But if we're being honest with each other, if you look objectively at the data, we have made zero progress, zero progress in closing those gaps. And these gaps are not simply racial disparities, though there are massive racial disparities. There are socioeconomic disparities all around the state of Minnesota. Anywhere you go in Minnesota, what you basically find is that low-income children, white children, black children, brown children, indigenous children, are badly trailing their middle class and more well-to-do peers. And when I, we look around the country, there are states that have made real progress in elevating all of their children. This is not an impossible problem to solve. Some people will say, no, 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 you've got it backwards. You need to first solve poverty if you wanna solve education. They have it backwards. The most powerful tool we have to break the cycle of poverty is through quality education for all of our children. And some other states have shown it absolutely can be done. So when we looked at Minnesota, what we realized is politics seems to be getting in the way. You know, we are a divided state. Two parties are divided, uh, only divided legislature in the country. And each party has its own solutions for education and they don't agree. And so what ends up happening is they agree to make minor changes around the margin without fundamentally changing the system that is providing this education and leading to these disparities. So more than two years ago, I reached out to Justice Alan Page, both because as Mark said, he's had a lifetime of passion for education equity and because he spent 22 years on Minnesota's Supreme Court. And I asked him, is there a way we could use the law to literally put children first and to break through the political barriers that are preventing us from making reforms? So together, we started by looking at the Minnesota State Constitution. The Minnesota State Constitution has an education provision in it that basically says children have the right to accessing an adequate education system. Well, what does that mean, an adequate education system? It's a system that is, on average, adequate. It is terrific for some students. It is lousy for others. And if your child has access to that system, whether they're on the top of the system or the bottom, it doesn't matter, their rights have been met. And when we looked around the country, turns out some other states have updated their constitutions to say, no, we can do better than adequate. We should create real strong rights, quality education for our children. You know, the Minnesota constitution, the education provision was written in 1857. And it basically hasn't changed since 1857. And as a quick reminder, in 1857, slavery was still legal in much of America. So the deeper we dug into this, the more we realized that Minnesota education system today is performing exactly as it was originally designed in the constitution. And we think we can do a lot better than that. So very quickly, I'm gonna give a high level overview of what our proposal is, then I'm gonna turn it over to Justice Page. We want to update the Minnesota constitution to create a civil right for every child in Minnesota to receive a quality public education. And then very importantly, make delivering on that right the highest priority of the state. We think enshrining it in the constitution can be a very powerful catalyst for systematic change to update our education system to meet the needs of all of our children and importantly, of our economy in the future. So with that, let me turn it over to Alan to offer his thoughts. Thank you. Thank you, Neil. Um... You covered that pretty well. Let me just give you a little historical perspective to how I come to this. I come to it after um, more than 50 years of speaking with 
school kids, parents, about the importance and value of education and why their children and how their children can use education as a tool to achieve whatever their hopes and dreams may be. Over that time period, things have not gotten better. Indeed, if anything, they have gotten worse. And when uh, President Kashkari offered me the opportunity to join him in, in doing what we could to, in essence, change the future, in essence, um, ensure educational justice, I was thrilled at the, at the chance. And so we, as Neil pointed out, we sat down and, and talked about what we could do constitutionally. What, what, what our guiding light should be. And looking at our current constitution, it is clear that as Neil pointed out, it focuses on the system and funding of that system. Well, education should be about children. And so we developed a, a proposal, an amendment to our constitution that would put children first and shift the focus, uh, not entirely away from the system and um, funding of that system, but putting children first. And as, as, as important in that is making sure that all children, individual children, children collectively and children individually are given uh, the opportunity to receive a quality public education. And our, the language, just let me quickly go through it. All children, have a fundamental right to a quality public education that fully prepares them with the skills necessary for participation in the economy, our democracy and society. People often ask, what does all children mean? Well, just that, all children. Black children, brown children, indigenous children, uh, rich children, poor children, rural children, urban children, able-bodied able children and disabled children, all children have a fundamental right to a quality public education. What do we mean by quality? Well, the constitution, the, la the language we've chosen tells us what we mean by quality. The quality standard is an education that fully prepares them with the skills necessary for participation in our economy, our democracy, and society. So that's the, that's the quality standard. Next, we think it's important that in assessing whether quality is being met, that there be uh, uniform standards. So the, the language goes on to say, as measured against uniform achievement standards set forth by the state. And let's not conflate the measurement tool for determining whether quality is being met with the quality standard. Those are two different things. As we exist today under our current constitutional language, we have fallen into the trap of using the measurement tool as the quality standard. And that doesn't serve anyone well. Indeed, it disserves everyone. And so it's important that um, we get away from the system that we have now that measures failure, measures failure of schools, and at least as I understand it, having talked with any number of teachers, it doesn't do anything to help teachers or students prepare themselves for what they need to do in the future. 
as important as anything in our proposal is this last sentence. It is a paramount duty of the state. That is to say, it's a state responsibility and the state would have no higher responsibility in anything it does than to ensure quality public schools that fulfill a child's fundamental right. And when I say it's a state responsibility, that means it's a legislative responsibility, an executive branch responsibility, and a judicial branch responsibility. We create, the, this proposed amendment creates a right to a quality public education, but a right without a remedy is not much of a right. And so it's important to understand that um, when the state fails to provide and meet a child's right to a quality public education, then the ch that child will have a remedy which will uh, help vindicate that right. It is, important that we move away from where we are today, focused on a system that has systematically failed children uh, across this state, and quite frankly, systems across the country that have failed children across the country. Virtually every state has a as constitutional language, uh, most of them use language similar to the language in the Minnesota Constitution. We have to ensure that all children, all children have the opportunity to achieve their highest selves, to be, to reach their fullest and highest potential through the education that is provided. Let me just add one thing. Thank you, Alan, and I'll turn it over uh, back to Mark. If you look at throughout American history, the, the biggest changes in our country have come through the establishment of civil rights. Think about the Bill of Rights, the freedom of speech, the freedom of religion. Think about the 13th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution, which finally prohibited slavery the 15th Amendment, which gave freed slaves the right to vote, or the 19th Amendment, which gave women the right to vote. And then, of course, Brown versus Board of Education, the landmark Supreme Court case. We are talking about creating a civil right for every child to receive a quality public education. That's the biggest idea we could come up with to change the direction of our state and make sure that we break through the barriers that are leaving so many children behind. And no, think about one more second, the right to vote. Imagine if the right to vote came with an obligation on the state to ensure that your rights were fulfilled, that you really had the chance to vote. That's essentially what we're doing here, the right to a quality public education, and then saying this is the state of Minnesota's highest responsibility to make sure all children's rights to that quality education are fulfilled. So we're excited about this. We think this can lead to transformation over time, and we appreciate the opportunity to be with you today. Thank you both so much for giving us this big picture of the historical perspective, but also that analogy so we can think about this in regards to our current situation. We've debated right to vote and things pretty recently here in Minnesota. So I want to ask you both, uh, either or both of you, um, how is this tackled in some other states? I know that uh, through a court case uh, in the Detroit schools in Michigan that was established by a court that there was a right to literacy, that the school system at a minimum had to be providing literacy to students. And this was, you know, not a full loaf of bread, but it was part of a bigger lawsuit that, you know, going after the, the whole system. Are there things in other states underway or that have come before us or uh, other options that give us some other um, sort of information to be thinking about that can be part of this discussion? Well, I would, I would first note um, that 
if, if I'm thinking about the same Michigan case that you're referring to, the district court found a right to literacy. The Sixth Circuit overturned that decision. There so is no the federal court overturned said there, there was no. There is no federal right to education. As far as what other states have done, um, and, and Neil, you can you can chime in here anytime you want, but the state of Florida, back in late the late nineties, ninety eight, ninety nine amended its constitution. Language, um, not exactly the same as ours, but certainly stronger than our current language that became the catalyst for the state, uh, the legislature, the executive branch coming together and changing their education system. Back in, at the time of that 1998-99 constitutional amendment, both Minnesota and Florida, in terms of uh, measurement of reading score and math skills for fourth and eighth graders, were somewhere in the mid-30s, 30th to 35th in the country. After Florida amended its constitution and uh, changed, made wholesale changes in the way they provide education. Florida is now sixth. Minnesota is still 30 to 35th. So not that we wanna follow Florida, but what is important in what Florida did was by amending their constitution, it created that catalyst for change. And, and, and if we get our constitutional amendment passed here, that's not the end of the, of the discussion. That really is the beginning. That's when we decide what an education for the 21st century and beyond is going to look like. You know, you talk about constitutional language, you talked about um, Brown versus the Board of Education and Thurgood Marshall. Our courts rely on precedent. And precedent means you look back to what came before. And often it's when, you, when, the, when you're interpreting language, particularly constitutional language, you look at the language that was put in place and what, what, what the meaning of the words were then. So we're still interpreting our constitution based on what Minnesota's founding fathers saw as what was important to education. Now think about that. Think about, as Neil pointed out, slavery, the fact that the world has changed dramatically since 1857. And I asked the question, why is it that we can't be the founding mothers and fathers for the future so that we're looking forward using language that we know and understand today and not looking back to uh, a time when people were held in bondage. Well, I, I'm uh, struck by the historic moment of this time where people are thinking so much has been opened up uh, COVID, uh, the murder of George Floyd, the economic dislocation, I mean, everything. Um, and it does remind me that um, our ability uh, to take a look at this constitution and to think forward um, was affected by those founders in the first instance. And, you know, we had two constitutions in the beginning. They're still around. Um, one put forward by one party um, that uh, took away the right to vote of freed African-American men, the other that maintained that right. 
And there was a big fight about this, physical and otherwise. And in the end, the compromise was taking away that right to vote, but a very, very, uh, in comparison to other states, simple process for amending the constitution. And the Minnesota Republican party then took three different tries at amending so that the right of freed African-American men could be re restored in Minnesota and they were successful. Took a decade. Uh, there's a lot to that story, but it's a reminder that uh, all things are, you know, go down a path that's not a straight path, but goes in and out. And we have this system of Minnesota uh, for changing our constitution. I was in office and you were on the court at a time where people attempted to use the constitution to make it much harder for people to vote, making it impossible for some people to get married. So we have to be aware that um, constitutional change is a very significant approach, but that seems to be the genius of what you're proposing is it's a moment where very serious change needs to be said out loud and adopted. And Brown versus Board of Education did not overnight change the country. I was a young boy in elementary school in the South of the United States, born in Georgia, living in Georgia and Florida. Um, it didn't change overnight. We've been- well, it, can, I, can, I just, can I just say one thing? It didn't change everything overnight. Correct. Thank you. But and all it, of these things it, it, take it time, time. It changed in very short order. It made it possible for the Voting Rights Act, the Civil Rights Act of 1964, all of those things would not, I think, would not have been possible, but for Brown striking down this concept of separate but equal. Yes. And so it didn't, it didn't fix education the way we all would have liked, but its impact was certain and relatively swift across the board. And in this new, era right now, um, what are the ways that citizens can better inform themselves, you know, participate in this discussion? Because unlike other paths to policy change, uh, this one goes first through the legislature and then it goes on the ballot for the well, voters. Uh, I'll uh, quickly answer that. Uh, you know, Alan and I are talking about the idea. I come at it from the lens of the economy. He comes at it through the lens of justice and his career and his life. An independent campaign has formed called Our Children Minnesota, which is organizing uh, citizens or grassroots uh, active on the at the Capitol to, act, to advocate for this. And so they could reach out to Our Children Minnesota and participate alongside and as part of that. You know, I'll, can I add one more thing? Just I really appreciate the historical context that you and Alan just offered. Why I think this is so important. I think we are at a gut check moment in Minnesota to answer the question, are we finally serious about addressing these terrible disparities that we have in our society? And I'm reminded, so it feels like the answer is yes. But then I'm reminded, I remember when Rodney King was savagely beaten and I don't remember 93 or 1994, the whole country was up in arms over that. Now we're gonna change. It was gonna be the catalyst for change. And then nothing happened. And so to me, we're at a moment where we can use this energy. You talked about it, Mark, whether it's George Floyd or COVID and say, let's come together and let's make the change. And the, the beauty of changing the constitution is it, it makes the change permanent. It seizes this moment, it changes the constitution. And now we have our North Star to guide us from here. So we don't lose sight. We don't get focused on other things as other things emerge as we have in our past. That's why I think now is so important. Well, it seems like that's the, the element of this slogan, I guess, about building back better. That in fact, 
there is this time of trying to recover education, the economy, just uh, life in a certain kind of way, but nobody wants to just go back to normal. In fact, I think the size and scope of the recognition that what we had before COVID was not okay, was not all right, was not fair, equitable, it was racist, it was built on enforced discrimination, many different things. It was uh, soulless, it didn't take care of mental health or many other things, okay. So that recognition does make this more than maybe just a gut check. It means that there's been, there's some agreement that we can't build back the same. Maybe there's just some shrugging saying, well, now we have pandemics to worry about, how do we build? But it feels like your work, and this didn't just happen because of COVID, that's what is important about you telling this story in a historical context as Alan has provided, and then how this particular uh, move forward. Um, I have watched a few constitutional amendments, some up close. Secretary of State had a responsibility in terms of, uh, you know, uh, naming that and being part of the process of making sure voters could participate, all of that. But it feels like you've done the homework and the preparation for this is not in reaction to the COVID moment, not that the COVID moment needs, needs a lot of things reacted to it, but this has been built up over time in recognition of the failure to make progress. And Alan pointed out, uh, having an example like Florida to sit next to it and say, wait a minute, um, what's, what's the deal here? So it does feel like that is a huge plus in terms of thinking it through. When you imagine it becoming part of the Constitution, how do you imagine that next step, which you've talked about a little bit, and you know about the state stepping up, and that this is going to take real resources? I mean, there you've talked about it, but it seems like imagining those next steps are also uh, something that's important because they will need to be prepared, just as the process of changing the constitution has to be prepared. What are you thinking about that? And is that also part of our children? You know, is it part of the, um, the nonprofit and you know, that sort of thing? I'm, I'm happy to start. And we believe this is a catalyst to start a process mm -hmm. by which the legislature and the governor would engage in a process to get input from the people of Minnesota. Ultimately, mm -hmm. it'll be the people, the parents, the teachers, the administrators, the legislators coming together to say, this is we want what we want our education system of the future to look like. And importantly, you know, let's just be clear, Al, neither Alan nor I are educators. We're not here to say, this is what the class size should be, or this is what the curriculum should be, or this is how they should teach. That's for the teachers and the parents to determine what their children need in order to be successful. And by the way, that might vary across the state. Different kids in different communities and different local economies may have a different focus for their educational needs. That's fine. Our point is this should be the highest priority of the state to deliver on this. And so that process that will follow, we think will be a very inclusive process where the people and the parents and the teachers of Minnesota will have direct input with their legislators and with the executive branch to craft that new education system of the future. Yes, I am noted that the preparation for being fully engaged in the democracy probably has changed in some people's thinking over the last couple of years and the last couple of months and maybe the last couple of weeks, um, being uh, able to participate in democracy also includes protecting the democracy and some things we never thought about, but also to be prepared for the economy. And the economy has certainly changed dramatically in the COVID environment. Some just claim it was moving in certain directions and it's been accelerated. But in any case, um, the you know, economy of the future that our children will inherit will look different than the ones that 
we inherited. And so, you know, your own experience, you know, as an engineer and, and in finance, I mean, you've had a lot of different experiences in life. And uh, like Alan and I, you've also run for office, which is a particular part of the economy and uh, bless your heart for that um, stepping up. But I'm wondering if um, this is a catalyst for also a bigger conversation, um, not just about what would a quality education that will prepare students for those characteristics, though that kind of future, but uh, what is our democracy and, and, and how do we approach it? What will our economy be and, and, and what do we want our, you know, I'm, I'm guessing that you could be taking this gut check moment about a very specific thing, which is the disparities in our educational system in terms of achievement and other things, and helping to lift it into a conversation about what kind of democracy, what kind of economy, what kind of society. Um, does that, do you ever get that feeling when you're uh, presenting or, or thinking about this? I mean, I, I'm happy to quickly start. I think the answer is absolutely yes. Alan and I have written about how many elements of justice we are ultimately talking about. Of course, racial justice, but it's also there are disparities in healthcare in our society. There are disparities in housing in our society. So many disparities. But for us, I mean, this this one amendment is not going to solve all of our problems in our society. Right? We're not we're not naive about that. But we do know that young people who get a quality education end up with better job opportunities, better housing, better access to healthcare. Their children end up having better opportunities. It's the most powerful tool we have to address many dimensions of disparities that we face in our society. But we recognize it by itself is not gonna solve everything. Justice Page, some young people in my neighborhood organized and changed the name of a beloved school to the Justice Allen Page School. Let, let me just say the the Justice Page rhinos. <laughs> there are rhinos on the bow tie. <laughs> They're going to start dominating the state football championship if you're not careful here. But how did it feel to see empowered young people taking on something? kind of personal to you. I guess you had to ignore a little bit of that because I mean you've become partly Minnesotan and you know this is some recognition but they were they studied this. They studied where the name came from. They studied what were the history. They studied what was happening um, and they, uh, then they, they made a decision. They not only studied you know it, it, it started off the students said what was then Ramsey Middle School. They decided that the name Ramsey, Alexander Ramsey, didn't represent who they were. And they decided, well, if the name doesn't represent us, we should change the name. They took it upon themselves to A, figure out how you go about changing the name of schools, which is not something that gets done every day. They not only figured out how to do it, they set about the task of doing it. That meant they had to engage the school board. They had to engage the superintendent. They had to work with the community, with their own, you know, with the school community and getting everybody on board to change the name. And then they had to decide upon a name. And what I find most interesting, and, and, and let me tell you this, Having Justice Page Middle School named for me is a singular honor, an honor that um, 
and I've had a lot of them, and not to diminish any of them, but this one is singular in that it was children, students, taking on what they saw as an injustice and trying to solve that and resolve that injustice. And so what did they do when they named the school? They didn't just name it Allen Page Middle School. That's not what they were about. What they were about was justice. And so they named it Justice Page Middle School. What more could you ask for? And to be a part of that and to have become a part of that community, and that's what it is. It is a community of school, of, of, of families, of children, um, of teachers, of administrators. It is, it is one of the most welcoming places I have ever been. Indeed, every, when, when, when we're not in isolation, every Friday, they welcome the school community into the school for, uh, to greet the students as they arrive, to send them off to, into the weekend with good vibrations. I, I have to tell you, I haven't seen anything and experienced anything like that. Well, I, I'm, I'm so glad you told us that whole story for all kinds of reasons, but here's one of them. I drive by that school and remember that it was my first um, uh, party caucus in my neighborhood where I started running for office. And so I have a kind of a funny, you know, like, Oh, that was a lot of work. Oh, that was great. Oh, that had hard days and good days. But when I drive by it and see your name, I, I think about you. But now that you've told that story so deeply, I now will be able to think about those junior high kids. What's more tenacious in our homes, let's say, than our junior hires, our middle schoolers? You know what I mean? And now that you've explained broadly and deeply the bigger picture, I then get the added benefit of thinking, oh yeah, they're the new leaders coming on. What a great bunch we have. I wonder what they think about education, police, health, food, siblings. Hey, isn't it great that they become empowered and able not just to figure out what to do, but to make it happen. And they, thank you for sharing that. They, they show you, show us the power of what can happen when we put our hearts and our minds and our bodies to the task and move forward and act. Amen. Last words to think about, maybe there's a couple thousand people around the planet, a couple dozen countries all over the country, things that you want to share that will help them carry this into their hearts, into their lives, into their work, because everyone who signed up for today cares about learning and learning for the future. Well, I'll just say very briefly, first of all, thank you for having us. This is a wonderful opportunity to share our message and our ideas all around the world. I mean, education is the most powerful tool we have to lift people up and to break the cycle of poverty. And so whatever people are doing in their own countries, in their own communities, in their own neighborhoods, thank you. I think we're all working on this together. Uh, you know, we've shared ideas that we're trying to bring forward in Minnesota. One, one positive surprise after we announced our proposal a year ago We've heard from groups in multiple other states in the United States who said, hey, we want to do something like this in our state. What can we learn from you? And so, you know, let's continue to learn from each other. Education, your knowledge is that one wonderful thing that it's not limited. You know, you can teaching more people doesn't take away from me. We can share knowledge widely and we can all benefit by helping each other to learn and to gain the skills we need to be successful. 
And I, I would just close by reemphasizing the example of what the, the children of Justice Page Middle School showed us. They showed us the power that we have to bring about change. They showed the power of what happens when we act. And we all have that ability. Some of us, you know, move the needle a little further than others. Some of us move it a little less. But when we act, we're all moving the needle. And everybody on this, in this conversation today has that power. Thank you both so much. Thank you for your life of service to our community and to the nation and the planet. But thank you for taking time today and for giving us this overview of a way to think about what do we do in this, let's call it gut check moment, to make sure we create the possibility and then act on building back better. I'm really looking forward to checking out that website. Our Children Minnesota. OurChildrenMN.com. OurChildrenMN.com. Thank you very much, President Kashkari. Thank you, Justice Page. And Justice Page, I also want to say the Diane and Allen Page Educational Foundation, incredible contribution to our community now and in the future. Thank you again. Well, th thank you, I, Diane. Um, you know, she, she created something there that we as a state can be proud of. Yeah, and its impact goes on. And that's how I think about the work that we're talking about here today. Exactly. You may not see all the pieces, but we're making it. And, you know, we inherited a state in good shape and in discredited shape. And our job is to keep making it better. Thank you so much. And um, we're going to return now, give people a little tiny break. And this afternoon, we dive into some of the specifics of what people are doing. And you've given us a kind of, a, I would say, a deeper way to think about all of the tactical things that fit our grand strategies. But those are about um, what kind of future do we want to create? And then what does that say about who we are as a people? It's a, it's a, daunting task and you've given us another path down that direction and I so appreciate you coming today and giving us this treasure from your life from your experience from your wisdom thank you thank you Mark thank you greetings again to everyone who's joined my name is Mark Ritchie and some of you have uh, come on at different times but I have the honor of serving as uh, president of Global Minnesota uh, and moderator for today. Uh, there are um, uh, a series of programs set out for the rest of today and, and you, can, you will have some information about that. But I wanted to give people uh, just a little bit of framework. Um, this morning we were looking at uh, the kind of global, what's happened with the pandemic and the COVID-19 situation. The theme of the day set by UNESCO, the United Nations Educational, Scientific and Cultural Organization, which is the kind of global organizer, was um, recovering and revitalizing education for the COVID-19 generation. So we've looked globally, we've looked nationally, and we've really looked locally. And this afternoon, we're going to take some of the specifics about how COVID has affected different parts of education. and the creative ways that people have been responding. We're gonna have a little tiny break about uh, five minutes or so, um, uh, coffee, etc. cetera. Uh, but we will begin uh, very precisely at one o'clock. Uh, I wanna make sure that we have a chance um, to kind of, you know, gather again. And, uh, uh, you know, we've had a kind of an amazing set of opportunities that we've heard about this morning, but this afternoon it will be equally rich and incredible in terms of specifics. I want to remind you that thanks to the generosity of um, St. Cloud State University, we have ASL or American Sign Language Interpretation and 
closed captioning on a special um, website. And so you can um, get that information on the feed, the YouTube feed. Uh, this afternoon, we will be uh, starting out, uh, you know, looking at a number of the specific things that people are doing. So I'll pick that up a little bit later. But I also want uh, to take this opportunity to um, thank again uh, to our sponsors who make this possible, um, our, some of our larger supporters, uh, corporate supporters, and our individual members. And to encourage those of you who are uh, joining us for the first time or uh, learning along the way with us, if uh, you would like to help support this, uh, please go to our website and join or contribute in some way. Um, it's the contributions of individuals and our membership that really make these free programs. Uh, Hormel Foods and St. Cloud State and Sundance Family Foundation and Communicating for Agriculture Exchange programs are our gold sponsors. Atomic Data and Highway uh, uh, Credit Union are silver sponsors. And we're again, so uh, grateful. Uh, to the individual members who year after year sustain us and make it possible for us uh, to uh, offer these gl now global uh, educational programs uh, on an educational basis. We will take uh, about a five minute, maybe six or seven minute break. Um, and we will uh, start again uh, right at one o'clock. Uh, and so, uh, Please uh, take this as a chance to refill that coffee cup and get ready for another incredible group of presentations and speakers heading into the afternoon. Thank you again for joining us. And uh, I wanna add one more thing. Uh, we will make sure that the video that we were not able to see uh, that Sandra Samuels shared, we could only hear the audio, um, that will be uh, included when we archive uh, all of this will be archived on our YouTube channel. Um, we'll insert that slideshow so you'll be able to, uh, to see that slideshow. And um, see you back here uh, right at one o'clock. I'll be back about a minute before, but see you then. Thank you. <laughs>